Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where OP's neighbor loses it over her security camera. New neighbor demands I take down my camera. I, 25 female, have lived in my apartment complex for a few years and we've always had a ring camera for security reasons and to avoid package theft that happens pretty often where I live. My ring camera is attached to my door and it faces my neighbor's door across the hall, about three feet away. Recently, a new neighbor moved in and she knocked on my door to ask if I could move my camera because it makes her uncomfortable that it faces her apartment door or turn off the motion activated sensor. I had no problem with this and I ordered a new mount to place it slightly to the side of my door so it's not a full view of their unit for their peace of mind. However, I think she assumed that I brushed her off because I didn't fix it the next day after she asked me to. As a result, she's been walking up to my camera multiple times a day leaving somewhat threatening messages in my camera, like, you don't want this to become a problem, or your liability is going to become my liability. And I don't even know what she means by that. But now I don't want to move my camera at all since she's trying to intimidate me and make me feel uncomfortable. Would I be the jerk if I don't move my camera anymore since she's trying to intimidate me? By the way, ring cameras are not prohibited in my complex and plenty of neighbors have them throughout the community. Speaking threats into a machine that's entire purpose is to record pictures and audio seems like a really good way to lose a lot of your money. Not the jerk. If you follow the laws of your country about ring cameras, you're okay. Keep records of neighbors coming to your door and also their messages. If there is any damage or they escalate, you have the evidence to bring the police. I broke up with my boyfriend over the most ridiculous thing ever. So I, 24 female, have two TVs set up in my living room. With my ADHD, it's hard for me to focus on one thing, so I usually play a game on one TV and have a show or a movie playing on the other. And when my now ex-boyfriend, 26 male, who we'll call James, joins me for gaming, we each play on one of the TVs. Side note, James did not live with me. I'm a big fan of The Sims, and before anyone says anything in the comments, I know it's better on the PC but I don't have the money for a PC that would support any games, let alone The Sims, so I play it on my PS4. Last night I was playing Sims 4 while James played Red Dead. Now if anyone here isn't a player of The Sims, you should know that most people play the game mostly to torment their Sims or to give them the messiest lives possible. So I was playing as a Sim who has several baby daddies and multiple side pieces while trying to become famous and making enemies left and right. Honestly, pretty tame for most Sims players in my opinion. But James glances over at my TV and sees my sim, Elise, romancing her latest conquest and says, Isn't that a different guy than the one you were on a date with earlier? Not thinking anything of it, I said, Yeah, Elise has like 20 boyfriends and 3 fiancés. James lost his mind. He started shouting almost immediately, asking me why I would be playing as someone unfaithful. I pointed out to him that it's just a game and I hadn't even been playing as a sim of myself. Elise doesn't look anything like me. Though I fully believe this argument would have been insane even if the sim looked exactly like me and had my name because, you know, it's not real. James said none of that mattered because I shouldn't be doing this in the game. He started calling me a cheater, insisting I must believe cheating isn't wrong if I play sims like this instead of making faithful characters. I told him that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard because I'm terrible at de-escalating things clearly and I pointed out that making loyal, nice sims with good morals was boring because half the fun of the game is causing drama. Then I said it was ridiculous to assume I was doing any of the things I have my sims doing because one, I don't like drama in real life. Two, I'm a homebody and don't like interacting with people too often. So when would I be meeting all these people I'm cheating on him with? And three, there's literally a man locked in a lease basement who spends all of his time making paintings and selling them to fund her lifestyle and if he's worried about me cheating because my sims do it, he should be checking my basement for captives. He said I was trying to distract him from my cheating and insisted on going through my phone. I told him there was no point. I wasn't going to keep dating a man who would call me a cheater because of a video game and I broke up with him. He yelled and shouted about this proving his point. My refusal to let him go through my phone obviously meant I was cheating. The entire time I packed up everything he had laying around my apartment. I got all his crap together, handed him the bag, told him to leave or I'd call the cops. I knew he would likely tell our mutual friends that we had broken up because I had cheated, but my mama raised a petty jerk. So as soon as he left, I sent a mass text to all of our friends, my family, and his sister. 
I don't have his mom's number, but his sister is a gossip, so she'll tell her. This is what I told them. Hey everyone, I just wanted to make you all aware that James and I are no longer together. James decided that me having a sim in The Sims 4 that had multiple boyfriends meant that I must be cheating on him, which I'm not. Feel free to reach out through text, but I'm understandably emotional right now, so I might take a day or two to respond. I sent it before he made it home and got a chance to spin the story to fit his version, and so far the only people who've reached out, they all think it's just as ridiculous as I do. I blocked James, and so far no one has said anything about his reaction to this, but I'm sure he'll be upset our friends all seem to think he's insecure and acted like a kid. Update. People wanted to know about the reactions to my text, so I figured I'd tell you all about the most important ones. One of my brothers showed up as soon as I responded to his text to let him know when I was ready to see anyone. He had a bag with him, and other than for work, he hasn't left yet. It's because in his words, dude's out here acting like a full-blown psycho over a video game, and you live alone. So he's been sleeping on my couch. My mom. She said, and I quote, I told you to never trust a man who has a roommate at 26. Jake's sister sent me a message telling me she ripped Jake a new one for his crazy behavior. She also said she was sad to admit I'd made the right choice because he didn't deserve me after that, but that I was her favorite girl he had ever dated. Then she asked for her permission to give her mom my phone number because she told her mom what happened and she wanted to speak to me. Jake's mom. I've only met her twice, but she called me to tell me she was so sorry her son had acted that way and that she hadn't raised him to behave like this. She said she was really upset with him for messing it up with me since I was her favorite girl her son had ever brought home. Once I started reading the messages I'd gotten during my me time, I found one from Jake's roommate and best friend, Paul. He messaged the night of the breakup, letting me know that he had gathered everything around their apartment he thought might be mine, and to let him know when I was ready and he'd meet with me to return my things. Jake hasn't even tried to contact me that I'm aware of. Maybe he hasn't figured out a way to get around being blocked, or maybe every one of our mutual friends ripping him to shreds in a group chat and his sister and mom being on my side made him realize he was being a jerk. So, because he plays Red Dead Redemption, that means he... just following his logic. Ah, yes. How I drive in Grand Theft Auto means that I personally believe that there should be absolutely no traffic laws of any kind. At least having 20 boyfriends and 3 fiancés sent me. And the bit about one of them being in the basement making and selling paintings to fund at least his life? OMG, so funny. You are awesome for breaking up with him on the spot. Well done. I think it's weird that you believe most Sims players play to do awful things to their Sims. I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought this. I do chaotic things, but not morally ambiguous things in the Sims, but each their own. It certainly is just a game and doesn't reflect on her actual morals. Am I the jerk for laughing at my cousin after she had an absolute meltdown after her boss saw her buying toilet paper at Costco? Yesterday I tagged along with my cousin on her trip to Costco. She's always been very high strung, but for the most part we were having a nice time. As we were in the checkout line, a very pleasant man in his 50s or 60s says hello. My cousin introduced him as the man who owns the company she works for. I sort of stood by as they had normal small talk and he even complimented her on helping out with a huge sale even though she's not in sales, and he told her they were still working out what the bonus was going to be, but it was going to be more than they initially thought. It seemed like a great interaction to have with a boss when you see them out in public. Shortly after he left, she started almost hyperventilating, saying, Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't believe what just happened. I had no idea what she was talking about, and then she started saying, We have to leave, we have to get out of here, that was horrible. I said, I have $300 worth of groceries, I can't just leave. She actually walked away and sat down in the food court and I was still so lost, but her leaving caused an even bigger scene because I had to go find her because they needed to scan her membership card. She was in absolute hysterics at this point and even the cashier asked if she was okay and if they could get her some water. We paid and walked out and she appeared to be so physically weak I told her to lay down in the back seat and I would load everything and drive. As I was driving, I finally asked her what was going on and she screamed at me, My boss just saw me buying toilet paper. Do you know how humiliating that is? I actually thought I misheard her, so I said, Wait, this whole thing is over toilet paper? She screamed, Yes, I'm probably going to be fired. 
I asked her if she seriously thought she was going to get fired for buying toilet paper. She said yes, that she can't let anyone at work know her private life. I told her I doubt he even noticed, and I also doubt he thinks about her bathroom habits, but he also probably assumes that she uses toilet paper like everyone else does. Then she screamed back, Your job is so easy, you couldn't possibly understand how much pressure I'm under at work, I'm going to lose it. At this point, I lost it and started laughing harder than I knew was possible. Not only was it ridiculous, but I felt like she was attacking me, and instead of going back and forth, I felt finding the humor was the way to go. She said, You're actually laughing at me? You're such a jerk. I do you a huge favor and you're laughing at me? She got to my house and dropped me off and sped off with my groceries. I called my aunt to at least make sure they got put in the fridge, but my aunt said my cousin overreacted, but I'll probably need to apologize to be able to get my stuff. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. But with that said, your cousin needs therapy. That is a level of anxiety that needs professional help, for her own sake. That has got to be an awful way to live. Am I the jerk for not paying for the things that my toddler destroyed? I, 36 female, have a two and a half year old son. He's energetic and curious, as every kid is supposed to be. Meltdowns are age appropriate, but he usually doesn't have them unless he misses sleep or he's sick. I make sure to let him release his energy on playgrounds, etc. every day so that he doesn't climb on furniture. Our parenting style is similar to that of the British show called Super Nanny. By that, I mean, for example, if you don't eat your vegetables, you won't get any dessert. No matter how much you cry, it won't change. Our bedtime routine starts at 1930, and unless there's an extreme case, 99% of the time, he will be in bed, trying not to be in bed to have more fun. We engage in a little dance where he comes back to me and I put him in his bed again and again. Rules are rules. My mother-in-law, who's 58, lives far away from us and invited us to her home so she could see her grandson face to face instead of everyday FaceTiming. Her home is filled with knickknacks, etc. It's not ideal for my toddler to live there for a week, but with our parenting style, if we say no, it means no. So we thought it would be manageable with my 24-7 supervision. What we didn't calculate was my mother-in-law's character. She's not a recovering people pleaser, she's a proud people pleaser. She thinks that she's like Mother Teresa, but it's actually one of my husband's struggles that he has to act extra aggressive to protect his mother from people using her. She started giving my son chocolate cake behind my back because he refused to eat proper, and I was like, he will eat when he's hungry. Apparently, she couldn't imagine a toddler being left hungry by his mother, and since he is refusing the meal, he has to eat something else, right? Whenever my son has meltdowns for things I wouldn't let him do, she saves him and does the thing with him because she couldn't bear watching him cry as if it were the end of the world. Thanks to her week-long actions, now my son thinks my mother-in-law overrides my rules. If he cries enough, he can get whatever he wants. So now he doesn't stop crying for a long time since eventually his angel of a grandma will save him. Today I woke up with the flu and my mother-in-law volunteered to babysit him. After a few hours, she came to my room asking for me to pay for her kitchen cabinets. Apparently, he was banging a ladle on the cabinet doors and made a lot of dents in the paint. I asked, where were you when this happened? She was right there. She wouldn't leave him alone, of course. Why didn't you take the ladle from his hands? Well, he didn't let her. After the meaningless back and forth with similar questions, and I already had a headache from my sinuses, I just went back to sleep, saying, no, I won't pay, and it seems like you need to discipline your grandson and be the bad guy for the first time. Now she's crying in her room. Am I the jerk? Update. So I took my rest, and when I felt better, I sat down with my mother-in-law and talked about how her actions affect my son and his relationship with me and the environment he's in. I told her that undermining my authority is never a good idea. Even though I might be stricter than she prefers, this is how I choose to raise my son. I've been with him 24-7 since the day he was born and I observe that he is happier and learning better with a more structured life. She tried to argue that she's a mom for 36 years and I'm just a mom for two and a half years. I told her my son is not the same person as her son, so they may have different needs. Plus, the times are different now. We grew up playing on the streets with our big cousins taking care of us when a car barely passed by. Every neighbor knew us and there was a it takes the village situation going on. On the other hand, my son doesn't have that, let him be free, they grow themselves kind of luxury. Well, since in her head, she's the best and nicest person around, 
she still tried to argue that whatever she did was good for her grandson. It took for me to threaten her with letting my husband know about this and let him decide what to do going forward. Then she accepted to act according to my wishes. There were a lot of comments in my previous post about what my husband does meanwhile. Well, he travels for work. He just spent the first day with us, then hopped cities for a week, auditing the franchising locations he's working for. And when the week ended, he came to take us to our hometown, which was yesterday. I try not to share every small disagreement with my husband, as he is always quick to action instead of thinking it through. While we have the same principles about life, and we agree about almost everything, I think his execution of our same ideas needs some more grace in my opinion. That was why my mother-in-law was afraid of his reaction to the situation. She knows for a fact he may decide not to show her grandson to her at all. Am I the jerk for wearing a gold dress to a wedding? I'm 30 female. My best friend Dan, who's 30 male, got married to Lauren, who's 27 yesterday. Me and Dan have been best friends since high school, and despite always being platonic with no romantic interests on either side, his now wife Lauren has always disliked me. In their three years of dating, I've not been allowed to see Dan alone because she feels that it's suspicious that I want to hang out with him. Honestly, I just missed my friend. Despite me being happily married, she's always kept me at arm's length. I always figured this was because she's from a very conservative family. Dan has spoken to her multiple times and after that she'll back off for a bit before reverting to complaining about him being friends with me again. It's not ideal, but she makes Dan happy, so I made my peace with it. That brings us to the wedding. Originally, I was going to be in the groom's party, but Lauren ended up crying about it. Dan was fighting her on this, but I told him I'll just attend as a guest and not to choose this hill to die on. The dress code was warm tone golden party, and we were encouraged to wear earthy warm colors. I picked out a bronze and orange dress that I thought would fit this perfectly, and the style even matched some examples they gave. In short, I thought I had nailed it. The wedding went great. However, at the reception, Lauren dragged me aside and said, I cannot believe you would wear gold to my wedding. You're not the first prize, you're just trashy. I was so shocked in that moment, I just stared at her. She practically screamed at me to leave and she was drawing attention so I grabbed my husband, said goodbye to Dan and left. Dan reached out after and told me he was upset I left his wedding so soon. Lauren's mom has texted me saying I ruined the wedding for her daughter and I'm stupid for wearing a gold dress. She's saying it's as bad as wearing white. I was genuinely not aware this was a thing. I want to reach out to Dan to explain, but I don't know if I'm in the wrong here. Am I the jerk? Any chance you or Dan have a crush on each other? OP, I'm happily married, and me and Dan would rather eat glass than have anything romantic between us. We're just not each other's type and see each other as siblings. I genuinely don't think Dan has ever secretly liked me either. What are you like compared to Lauren? OP, that's hard to answer. We are two completely different people. I think we are both attractive in our own way. I'm your Barbie stereotype. 5'11", blonde hair with a six-pack. She's a petite brunette bombshell with a beautiful tan and a full figure. I'm also a good two inches taller than Dan, hence he's not my type. I'm not his. So it's comparing apples and oranges, but I do get your point. Is she uncomfortable with just you? OP. Not just me, but any woman. She doesn't believe in platonic friendships with the opposite gender. Why does Lauren's mom have your number? Can't you just forward that message to Dan? OP. My guess is that she got it from the group chat. Update. Many of you have asked if the dress that I wore stood out, and honestly, I know I'm biased in saying this, but I genuinely don't think so. Another girl was wearing the exact same dress, but in a dark red, which we had a laugh about. Slip dresses are a pretty common wedding guest dress where I am, and it was the type of dress that was recommended by the bride. I think many of you were right in saying that it was never about the dress, but how I looked wearing it. My parents confessed last Christmas that my sister was the product of my mother's affair. I, 19 male, was always treated as the golden child of the family. Lavish birthdays, lavish gifts, lavish everything. I liked the attention initially when I was a kid, but as I grew older, I grew more and more sympathetic to how my parents treated my sister, who's 18. I never understood it. It wasn't that they treated her badly, it's just that she was a complete afterthought, and as I grew older, that hurt me a lot. I started working part-time jobs at 14 and started saving up money to get her birthday gifts and other gifts. It wasn't much, but it had thought and effort, something which my parents lacked. It was pretty obvious that my parents were the biggest cause of my sister's self-esteem issues. 
They always talked about how smart I was, how I was destined for big things, and they bragged about it to other friends and extended family, but they hardly ever praised my sister. I was pretty fed up with it all, and after graduating high school, I rejected an offer to go to an Ivy League because I didn't want my parents' help to pay for my college education. I did get acceptance into a decent university, which offered me a full-ride scholarship, and I accepted that. A year later, my sister too got accepted into the same university with almost a full-ride scholarship. Four months ago, we were at our parents' house for the Christmas holidays, and my parents confessed that my sister was the product of an affair that my mother had. They straight up said that they will never love her, that she was a mistake, and that they wanted nothing to do with her anymore now that she was 18. It was shocking. My sister was obviously devastated. My sister and I immediately left the next day. Before leaving, I told my parents that they were done to me, and I wanted nothing to do with them anymore. I seriously can't stand them, and I'm not sure why my mom was even crying. Anyways, it's been three months. My sister and I have both taken a break in college for a semester. My sister is struggling, but we've moved in together and it's gotten better the last couple of weeks and she has also started therapy last week. I will never contact my parents ever again in spite of all they've done for me. I'm dead set on that. But I wonder, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Good on you for not leaving your sister to fend for herself. She was not the person who cheated. Your parents are horrible in my opinion. Good luck, OP. Hope you and your sister do really well in life and share not a moment or a penny with those jerks who would do that to you. Not the jerk. You're doing the right thing. They decided to blame and punish the only innocent person in the situation. They suck. My daughter ended my relationship with my girlfriend. How do I handle this? I'm 42 male. My girlfriend Liz is 35. I debated whether to write this post because I'm concerned my daughter might see it, but I'm at a loss for what to do here. I lost my wife, Kate, six years ago when my daughter, Sally, was 10. I started dating again at the beginning of 2021 when we were all mostly comfortable walking around in public without fear. With my first two girlfriends, the relationships never made it long enough for me to feel comfortable introducing them to Sally. I started dating my now ex-girlfriend, Liz, in November. She met my daughter last month and as I sort of expected, she wasn't too friendly with Liz. She wasn't flat out rude but she was definitely cold towards her. Liz never pushed in either way. She tried making small talk about books, music, movies, anything, but my daughter wouldn't give her any more than single word answers. We knew it would take time for her to get used to the idea of me dating again. I understand that. A couple of weeks ago, Liz came by after work so we could have dinner and she was excited to show me an old yearbook she found from when she was in high school. We looked at it, made fun of people's hair, etc. There was a picture that had a heart around it and my daughter asked about it. That was Liz's first boyfriend. You could obviously tell that was drawn on ages ago. Two days ago, Sally comes to me telling me she saw Liz cheating on me with some random dude. At no point did I believe my daughter about this. She said she saw her kissing and hugging some guy at the park and it was just obviously not true. Just the fact that she said she saw her at the park was enough to know she was lying. Liz has seasonal allergies. You couldn't pay her to go to a park in spring. I feel like she wasn't even really trying to convince me. Maybe she was just trying to start a fight. I don't know how to explain it. There was no concern in her voice like you'd think she would be upset someone cheating on her dad, right? No, she sounded annoyed that I was asking questions and poking holes in her story. I called Liz and I told her what Sally had said and I assured her that I didn't believe a word of it but asked if she would come by so we could address it together. When Liz got home, she asked Sally to please sit on the couch and tell her what it is that she thinks she saw. She went on about how she saw her at the park kissing a random guy. She was trying to describe the guy that she saw with the heart around his picture. Liz told Sally she was a little disappointed she couldn't come up with something better than accusing her of cheating with the guy she saw in her yearbook. She mentioned that if Sally had even bothered to look at the yearbook, she would have seen it's not even from the same state we live in. The odds of finding him here are abysmally low. Not adding the fact that he was a jerk and you wouldn't catch her breathing the same air as him if you paid her. Sally didn't say anything and wouldn't look up from her lap. Liz said she needed a few minutes to think and that she was going to make herself a cup of coffee. She comes back a few minutes later and tells Sally that she understands that she misses her mom and that she's probably thinking that if her mother had never passed, she, Liz, would have probably never been a part of our lives. That she never intended to replace her in any way, shape, or form. All she ever tried to do was help me out in any way she could 
because she was hoping there was a future where all three of us at the very least were civil. She said that if she was in Kate's position, she would have wanted someone to keep me company, be a partner and a friend, anything but to be alone. She gave the example that if I was ever sick with a bad flu, I could feel comfortable knowing there was another adult I could trust to hold down the fort. Just a friend, really. And then she tells me, I'm 35 years old. I am way too old to be playing this kind of he said, she said drama. I really wanted us to work out, but not at the risk of your relationship with your daughter. I tried telling her that we can work this out, but she reminded me that I've known her for less than one year. That we had not hit the sunken cost issues yet, and it wasn't worth destroying my relationship with my last piece of Kate. She picked up her purse and keys and left. She won't answer when I call her, and the few times I've texted her, she either leaves me on red or gives me a flat no when I asked if we could meet and talk about this. I was left speechless. I still can't even look at my daughter. I understand she's struggling, but I feel 16 is old enough to know better. I changed the password to the Wi-Fi. We live in a rural area. Without the Wi-Fi, she might as well not even have electricity. What do I do? How do I handle this? My suggestion would be to get your daughter some therapy. And regarding your dating life, you should probably keep things separate until your daughter is off to college. As for the lady you were seeing, I would just let her go. She's not ready for your situation, and not many would be. Also, sorry for your loss. Your daughter didn't end the relationship. Your girlfriend did. Your daughter doesn't like her, and that's okay. This was one incident that settled things in Liz's mind. If she stayed with you, it would destroy your relationship with your daughter. That's what Liz thinks, and she could be right. Because you went and punished your daughter because an adult woman doesn't want to date you anymore. I guess your relationship with your daughter doesn't matter to you. Or you would have tried to understand her feelings, do some research, and prepare her for your dating, again. Go to therapy. Liz was kind, the next one might not be. And I suspect that you'll kick out Sally if your next girlfriend gets treated the same as Liz and makes a different decision. You need to work on your relationship with Sally. She should matter the most to you, and part of your job is to make her an adult that isn't afraid of losing her father's love when another woman comes on the scene. She doesn't want to date him anymore because of the crap his daughter pulled about her. He's punishing her for lying. Your take is crap. Liz broke out because she doesn't want to bear all this drama if she stays honestly. She doesn't want all the stress. The source of the drama is the daughter. So she is the person who needs to be held accountable, not be patted on the head. No, the source is dad. Don't take it out on her and let her have the Wi-Fi again. She probably needs therapy or at least assistance from friends, which she can't even contact depending on how rural you live. Make sure not to leave her out. She needs you more than you think. Dude, you need to get a grip. Your priority should be your daughter, unless you want her to stop talking to you once she turns 18. Liz did you the favor of a lifetime. She's 100% right that you need to repair your relationship with your daughter before bringing anyone else into your lives. Even if that means putting yourself on the back burner, that's the decision you made when you decided to have a kid, that her well-being would come before yours. Obviously, having a new person around is not what she needs right now. Your job as a parent is to help her, not to punish her for not being over her mom passing. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or his daughter? Please share your thoughts. It never ceases to amaze me the lengths these commenters go to to justify horrific actions. Karen tries to use our store as her own Etsy shop. I worked in a large department store back before there was Etsy or any similar service for artists to open up independent shops. I worked in the back office administration piece, not out on the floor. One day, one of the checkout girls called me over and said they were trying to scan a lady out, but one of her items didn't have a barcode. I figured maybe it had been stuck on somewhere strange, but checked it out and I didn't see anything. In fact, I didn't even recognize the item when I looked to see where I could find a second one to scan and I knew the store pretty well. It was an absurdly hideous piece of almost homemade looking costume jewelry, not like anything we offered. I thought maybe we had a new supplier I was unaware of, so looked at the tag, and lo and behold, it was a hand-drawn price tag, so definitely not ours. There were a lot of shops in the area, so I figured someone bought it nearby and it slipped out of their bag or they set it down by accident and that this customer assumed we were selling it because of the price tag. I figured whoever left it would be back to look for it soon. It was way overpriced, $80 for the one necklace. So brought it to customer service and returned to business as usual of counting the minutes to close and regretting my life choices. But as the day marched on, a few more people appeared with similar stuff. 
some more jewelry mostly. One with a sweater that was actually a sweater we did sell, but with huge garish rhinestones added on that were definitely not a skew we offered. People kept coming to check out with lots of things we actually sold, like makeup mirrors, handbags, and shoes, but all with unnecessary rhinestones, sakins, and beads glued on that definitely didn't come from us or the original manufacturer. So finally, the manager just had to do a sweep of the store and collect anything with rhinestones on it or anything with a handmade price tag and put them in the lost and found. Though we did wonder how someone's personal belongings would become scattered all throughout the store and didn't think they could have really been accidentally lost. Our working theory was that someone got in a fight with their shopping companion and did it out of spite, like maybe a couple broke up or a sibling rivalry or something, but we resigned ourselves to the fact that we had never know. Our lost and found was a single basket about the size of a TSA security bin at the airport and there was so much of this stuff that it overflowed past the top. So after a couple days, we dumped it all in the trash. A few days after that, a middle-aged woman comes in decked out head to toe in sakins and glitter and rhinestones with neon makeup like a sixth grader would wear to their first school dance and asked to speak to the person in charge, identifying herself as one of your partners. I knew we were about to get some answers to the other day's mystery. I stopped all my work. I was ready to hear how and why she ended up leaving half her wardrobe scattered around and why anyone would voluntarily dress like that after 40. So I listened to her going at it with the customer service and it became clear she had bought things here. Maybe unclear if she'd even paid for them or not, or if she'd just used things from here without paying for them. She then bedazzled them, either by purchasing them or covertly bedazzling in the store without buying the items. We never did find out which. She then put them back on the shelves and now expected to collect a check after they were purchased at an upsell price that she had added on with her handmade price tag. Apparently, she had done this in a few stores and was going around with business cards claiming her designs, bedazzled versions of department store products, were sold in big department stores like Karen's Fab Designs as seen on the shelf of Macy's, Nordstrom's, JCPenney, and more. The manager explained this was not a consignment store and she couldn't just leave altered products here for people to buy and expect to split the money with us. She was sure we must just not understand that she had improved the items with rhinestones, thereby making them more valuable and was shocked when the realization set in that we understood what she was saying but still didn't want her doing it. She was irate, offended, threatened to break off the partnership that we did not want and did not know we had and eventually demanded the stuff back. The most senior manager on the floor had come over by this point, not because she had asked to speak to the person in charge, but because she was causing a scene and none of us were sure what to do about being on her business card. Plus, everyone, regardless of seniority, was equally curious about the rhinestones mystery and he explained we had gotten rid of the stuff because she didn't bother to explain this arrangement to any of us and we aren't a pawn shop where you can hawk personal goods. A major argument ensued. She gave us two choices. Go through the dumpster and salvage the things you threw out or refund me the adjusted red upcharged cost of the items you threw out. The manager then gave her two choices. Leave or be escorted out by security. The manager did worry that there could be repercussions for throwing out all her stuff since technically corporate policy was that we were supposed to hang on to lost and found items for seven business days so he offered her some coupons to end things on a good note. She didn't take them and screamed at us that we needed to replace everything and pay for new material to re-bedazzle them. At that point, the manager more flatly insisted she leave. She didn't. Security had to escort her out. To our total shock, she kept telling security she worked here and really confused them because they had never seen her, so weren't sure if it was because she was crazy or if it was because she was from corporate, i.e. someone who could fire them. We had to explain to security and her that in fact she did not work here and this partnership was non-existent. Again, explaining that she couldn't sell her own products here in our department store. She kept saying, we can negotiate you a higher cut, that was just my starting offer. So after a bit, the manager just gave up on explaining and stopped engaging with her. She tried to come in every day for a week after that, to the point that we had a security guard stand right near the door to redirect her before she could even step over the threshold. She got in one more time through the fire door, with which she set off an alarm and we had to evacuate the store. 
so we let her know loud and clear that next time the police would handle her. I guess some other stores had already made it good on that promise, so she stopped coming. But she kept doing this elsewhere around town for several weeks until she was blacklisted by every store from the highest end boutiques to the dollar store. I don't know if she didn't understand how stores worked or just didn't care, but she really created a lot of extra work for us. I will say this, many people were coming to the register to purchase her items, and that department chain is bankrupt now. So she probably has a lucrative Etsy type store. And the last laugh. So what if you had worked at this store and you caught Karen doing this? What would you say to her? Please let us know. That hustle though. I want to know why they didn't work something out with her. Sounds like she knew what she was doing to be honest. Am I the jerk for telling a friend's boyfriend her intentions of getting pregnant? A couple of years ago, a close friend, Ashley, started a long distance relationship with a guy, Chris. He has been really good to her and after meeting in person a few times, they decided to move in together. I was super happy for her as she had a few bad relationships over the years and it was nice to see her in a healthy one. That joy faded the last couple months before she moved a few states over to be with him. The issue isn't her moving, but that she repeatedly joked about having a baby from Chris. At first, I accepted it as jokes, but over time, I realized Ashley was serious. For context, Ashley has two kids from a previous relationship, ages 10 and 12. Chris absolutely doesn't want kids. He told her this at the start, and any time she hinted possibly wanting more, he shot it down, saying it was a deal breaker. Now, Chris is more than willing to accept her kids as his own because he loves her and after meeting her kids, them as well. He's accepted that they are a package deal with her and since they're at an age where they are semi-independent, it's not an issue for him. To me, Chris is a real bro for taking on her kids without issue. Hearing Ashley say she wants a baby from him one way or another really bothered me to no end. It's hard enough to find a partner that treats you well and accepts kids that aren't their own. To find one that does and then talk about plotting to force a baby seems gross and manipulative. Before her move, I had sat down with Ashley trying to talk sense into her. At first she resisted, but finally it seemed she understood how crappy it would be. After I felt like she had understood, I put the issue behind me and helped support her through the hassle of moving. A few days after she left, I got a call from a mutual friend who delves into the metaphysical realm. She was distraught and confessed to me that shortly before Ashley's move, Ashley had come to her asking for a fertility spell. This friend didn't feel really comfortable about it and refused. When pushed, she said she cast a spell for a healthy and honest relationship but told Ashley it was for fertility. As you can imagine, I was livid. I messaged Ashley, confronting her about what I learned and she laughed it off as she was desperate. But magic is fake anyway, so what's the harm? She then let it slip that since Chris is planning on getting a vasectomy in a few months, she was doing everything she can to get pregnant as soon as possible. At that point, I couldn't stay silent. I gathered up screenshots of all the conversations over the last few months and sent them to Chris. He understandably freaked out and kicked her out. Now Ashley hates me because she was kicked out after a huge move and didn't have a job or money to make it back. She said I'm a terrible person for putting her and her kids out on the street. Am I the jerk here? Should I have kept quiet? What would you have done in this situation? Would you have told Chris the truth about Ashley or not? Please let us know. That girl needs help, like for real bruh. Entitled mom at Starbucks. Years ago in college, I worked at a Starbucks near a high school and middle school. We always had an after school rush with tons of kids getting frappuccinos. If you've never worked at Starbucks, you probably don't know how the drinks are made. So I'll inform you on the magic of the caramel frappuccino. It's basically ice, sugar, milk, sugar, coffee, base, whipped cream, and sugar. The coffee base comes to the store as a powder and they mix it with warm water at the store. We don't brew it there. So I get this girl ordering a caramel frappuccino. No extra requests, just the standard drink. I made it, so I know it was made correctly. I was a trainer and shift supervisor and had a fancy black apron. She brings the caramel frappuccino back, complaining that the coffee tastes burnt. I actually laughed. It's basically just coffee flavoring, and if you've ever had one, they don't taste like coffee at all. So I kindly explained that, well, the coffee in this drink isn't brewed and it all comes from the same place. So yeah, of course I'll remake it, but it will definitely have the same flavor. I offered to do extra caramel flavor and topping to make it even sweeter. She agreed. I remade the thing, asked her to try to make sure it was better this time. I even tried a sample of that pitcher in a tiny cup to make sure nothing was off about it, like maybe there wasn't enough water in the mix. It was fine. 
So I called the girl up to the counter again, gave her the second frap, told her to keep the first one. OMG. So like an hour later, mom comes in with the kid. She was demanding I give them their money back. She was all mad because I was rude to laugh. I tried to explain that sorry, it's just really funny, and I wanted to explain how the drink was made so the kid could order it the way she likes it next time. I also explained that we don't give cash back. I gave her a brand new drink she was happy with and offered a free drink card for next time. No go. I'm calling corporate to report your rude behavior, blah blah blah. I gave her the phone number and said, be my guest, all with a smile. Edit. The hot chocolate story. Here you go, folks. The case of the too hot chocolate. My other post made people happy, so here's another one from Starbucks. It was near closing time when a regular came through with their usual order, two kids hot chocolates. The espresso machines had a button for kids temp, which automatically shuts off the streamer at a slightly lower temperature. Regular temp is like 160, 140 for kids, I think this was years ago. There's a couple of facts to the case that need to be mentioned. One. These folks normally came through during rush, so their drinks would usually be sitting on the cashier counter for a few minutes before being handed through the window. 2. Our second and third espresso machines were already taken down for cleaning that night. So when they pull up, they get their hot chocolate immediately off the bar, no wait time. I could tell that the couple were in a bad mood, but I didn't really think about it. Well, the crew and I hear literal tires screeching and see the vehicle pull through the drive through straight to the window. The husband knocked on the window, but I was already on my way from the back to go see what was up. Mom yells, These hot chocolates are way too hot. If I gave this to my kids, they'd burn their mouths. So I offered a few fixes. Milk and ice cubes or two extra whipped cream. No go. Mom wants them remade at kids temperature this time. I left the original drinks in view of the window. As a seasoned food service worker, I know what happens if those leave view. So we remade them, added a splash of cold milk and handed them over. Mom screamed, These are the same ones! I pointed out the ones on the counter, which had stickers. Since this didn't go through the register, no stickers. They take the drinks and mom comments, How hard is it to mess up a hot chocolate? Then we see them pull into a parking spot. I sent the two baristas to the back and had my shift supervisor in training up front because I knew this was going to be bad. The people hanging out in the cafe area heard the entire thing and were all watching the door as well. Mom comes in yelling about how she's so glad she tested the drinks the first time because they were way too hot. I gave her two free drink cards. She said we owed her more than some free drinks. She wanted an apology. I didn't see it, but she accused my coworker of rolling his eyes. She then goes on to scream, I own my own business and I'd never treat people with this level of disrespect. The hot cocos fly at us. We dodge. At this point, I pointed to the door and just said, Out. Now. Or we call the police. Do not come back to this store. We have your license plate on camera. This whole thing is on camera. She left immediately. They came back one other time during the day. I marked out their drinks, so they got them free, and I reiterated, Do not ever come back here. They never did after that. The third case fact I'll put here, because we had no way of knowing beforehand. 3. That machine was overheating and not shutting off at 140. I checked after close and it was going to 160. But we had no way of knowing at the time of the incident and if I had known, I would have asked the barista to just do it manually. But so much was made of the kid's temp thing, I ensured that she pressed the button. The end. Speaking of Starbucks, what's your favorite drink from Starbucks? Please let us know. Mmm, coconut frappuccino for the win. Am I the jerk for making a fake diary entry to catch my stepmom? I, 17 female, have been staying with my dad and my stepmom. My mom is a doctor, so she was super paranoid about my family living with her during what's going on. But as things where I live are settling down, she let us come stay with her again. My stepmom has known me for two years and our relationship has always been weird. She's a nice person, but she can be pretty mean and childish if we do something she doesn't like. She also has a tendency to run to our dad if she hears something bad about us. Long story short, I have a diary and I keep a lot of private stuff in it. Dad called me a few days ago, we were visiting with our mom, saying he has to talk to me when I come back. Apparently, I was in trouble because of something I apparently said to stepmom. When he told me what she said I had said, I immediately recognized it because I wrote it in my diary. I realized a lot of the stuff I wrote down was stuff she was telling him so I decided to come up with a plan to see if I was right. 
I wrote a fake entry, basically saying stuff I would never do in a million years and set the trap. Dad calls me while out visiting with friends and when I come back, he grounds me for what I did. Stepmom comes in later, apologized and said it sounded concerning and she had to tell. I told her it was fake, knew she read my diary and refused to speak to her. My dad came in and tried to talk to me and I told him that stepmom was reading my diary and he didn't believe me. Now I'm with my mom and I don't know if what I did was fair. I felt it was the only way to prove my point and I didn't know what else to do. Am I the jerk? Who do you think is in the right? OP or their stepmom? Please let us know. Oh, I just love invading other people's privacy. Maliciously complying with a no phone rule in science class. My junior year of high school, 2016 to 2017, I had to take a biology class. It was generally a freshman or sophomore class, but as I had been jumping between high schools, I still needed the biology credit. As such, I was the only junior in the class. My science teacher was a very rude person. Not in a I hate you kind of way, but more in a I'm better than all of you and I can do no wrong kind of way. He made it a habit to hand out detentions like candy to the point where the school had to ask him to stop giving people detention. Obviously, none of us liked him and made it our sole purpose to annoy the crap out of him. And thus, the entire year was full of malicious compliance from all of us, like not coming back to class when he sent us out of the room. As the teacher added more rules, it became easier to find ways to annoy him. When he added a rule about leaving backpacks in the front of the room with phones in them, I was already having a bad day and decided to have some fun. We were watching some video about turtles and I was using my phone. When he caught me, he told me to put it in my backpack, so I did. About 10 minutes later, I decided to make it look like I was on my phone by putting my hands under my desk and looking in my lap. Anytime he yelled at me, other students would yell back saying, he's not even on his phone, why are you yelling at him? I did this several times throughout the class and he moved me three separate times to try and watch me better and catch me on my phone, which wasn't with me. I finally ended up at the front of the room in front of the projector playing the turtle movie, facing the rest of the class in a chair with no desk so he could see my hands. This made it so no one could watch the movie, which means we couldn't take the test on it. Three weeks later, the teacher proudly told our whole class he wouldn't have to deal with kids like you anymore because he was switching to a middle school the next year. I guess he was wrong because the next year he got fired from the middle school as none of his students were on track with any other school in the district. Edit. The turtle movie wasn't part of the material we were supposed to be learning. Our teacher just liked turtles and wanted to watch a movie about them, so the class already wasn't focused on what it should have been. Most of the material we learned in that class wasn't what we were supposed to be learning. Same reason he was fired from the middle school the next year. Speaking of turtles, do you like turtles? Please let us know. I like turtles. Fine then, I won't stay inside your house. So this happened yesterday to my grandma's youngest brother and his wife. They had an argument about a lot of issues which I won't get into and ultimately the argument escalated to a full-blown verbal fight. It's because of husband's dismissive attitude and anger issues. The husband is a jerk and he said that if the wife can't respect his wishes then she can't stay inside his house. The wife is upset and packs a suitcase and leaves the house at around 9.30 p.m. at night. He assumes that she will come back by 10 and doesn't even try to stop her. He waits till 11 p.m. and she isn't back and also she is not answering any calls or replying to texts. His 20-year-old daughter starts crying and made a huge scene in the house. He sets off to go and search for her. It's important to note that this is a small rural town where everyone knows each other. The husband has an old car with no silencer and a few people in the nearby houses wake up. He explains what happened to them and then everyone starts searching for her. It's 1 a.m. in the morning and still she has not been found. The police station in town is at least four hours away, so they have to go in the morning. Also, it was on lockdown. The husband is extremely worried and everyone was angry with him for being so unkind to his wife and not stopping her. Someone then suggested one last search in the estate that they have just in case they find at least some clues. This time, they even checked the terrace of the tiny building where the solar panel was placed, which had been deemed unnecessary before. The terrace was surprisingly unlocked and when they went in, they found her. She had made a small pillow of her clothes and was sleeping with her head on the suitcase. She was woken up and it was found out that she had switched off her phone. The wife knew that it wasn't safe to go out at night, but she didn't want to go back to her house, so this was the place she chose to stay in. The best part is that the daughter already knew. She denied it, but confided in grandma, and she did the extra theatrics to scare her dad. Everyone still took the wife's side and some people even threatened the husband. 
In conclusion, the husband is really scared of the wife and will definitely keep his anger in check in the future. Am I the jerk for not paying for my date's meal? Okay, so this story took place a few years ago, but it's something that still crosses my mind occasionally. When I, 20 female, went on a date with my friend, 22 male, it didn't go exactly as planned. We had been speaking for about a week or so prior about going out to dinner somewhere. It was his idea and he was fairly persistent. He was insanely interested in me and while I wasn't as interested in him, I figured I'd give it a shot. He had originally wanted to take me to a steakhouse, which I was later glad we didn't. We ultimately settled on a local Mexican restaurant. Dinner was going well and the conversation was flowing smoothly. We ordered our meals, nothing too expensive, and some cheese dip. The bill would have been probably around $30 or so. After we're finished eating, my friend comes out of complete left field with, So, I don't actually have any money. Can you pay for the meal? To say I was shocked was an understatement. This guy had been begging me to come out to dinner with him for an entire week, almost picking out an incredibly expensive restaurant, the steakhouse, knowing he had absolutely no way to pay for anything, not even his own meal. I'll admit that I had enough money to cover both of the meals. However, I told him I only had enough to cover my own. Had he have been upfront with me about paying for the meal before we ever went out, I would have been more than happy to. However, I was blindsided. I took the bill and explained to the restaurant manager that I was only paying for my portion and the cheese dip. He then began arguing with my friend about how he needed to pay for his meal. The manager obviously wasn't just going to allow my friend to leave, so I told him I needed to go. He couldn't believe I wouldn't help him out and I ultimately unfriended him for putting me in such an awkward and embarrassing situation. Should I have just paid for his and called it a day? I've never been the type of person to just expect people to hand over money or pay for my things, so I don't expect it from others either. What would you have done in this situation? Would you have paid for his meal or not? Please let us know. I'd help that boy find a job is what I would do. Karen wants her stolen table set back. When I was 9 in 2011, my folks and I moved into a rental house. The previous tenant left behind two things, a beautifully carved stone table and chair set and a very shy ginger cat. We adopted the cat. The table and chairs sat in the front yard, easily seen by anyone walking past. Coming home from school, I find my mom talking with police and a massive dead patch of grass where the table used to stand. Somehow, someone had stolen the table set. It wasn't light, a truck would have been needed to cart it away. We never got it back. A year later, Karen knocks on the door. The conversation may be paraphrased slightly as it happened so long ago. Mom, hi, can I help you? Karen, yeah, hi. I used to live here and wanted to organize a time to retrieve my stone table set. Mom, the table set that was sitting in the front yard? That's the one. I was thinking, Mom, hold on, hold on. That set was stolen about a year ago. And even if it wasn't, you left it here without any contact for over two years. Landlord tried to contact you, but you essentially abandoned the property. Karen, well, I didn't have room for it at my new place. Now I do. I have the receipt, so it's still mine. Mom, it was stolen, and I noticed you haven't asked about the cat you left here either. Karen, you think you can push that thing on me when you don't have my table set? Mom, God, no. I wouldn't let you anywhere near him with your attitude. He's registered to us now anyway. You have no more business here. Leave. She slammed the door in Karen's face. I had never seen my mom so angry. She hugged our cat for 10 minutes straight. Karen wasn't finished though. She called the cops, because of course she did. Cops arrived, Mum went out to meet them. She didn't want me to hear what went on, but she summarized later. Basically, Karen claimed Mum was hiding her table set and preventing her from getting her property back. Mum explained what happened, provided the landlord's phone number, and suggested they look in their records, because the table was officially stolen. Police left, Karen didn't get her table, we kept the cat. Karen loses it on poor cashier because she couldn't give her money to feed her kid. Today I ran into possibly the most entitled Karen and Goblin I've seen in a while. So a little backstory. My best friend is British, while I'm Latin American. As an early birthday gift, she sent me some cash through Western Union for me to get my nails done at this incredibly fancy salon I'd been wanting to go to for a while and I had to pick it up at this agency where you can collect cash or pay bills. When I got there, there was a huge queue, but since I was on a tight schedule, I had no option but to bite the proverbial bullet and queue. Anyway, I walked over to the queue, whipped out my Nintendo Switch, and proceeded to search for moons all over Mario Odyssey's world. After maybe five minutes, 
A young woman that was already in the queue told us that Western Union system was down and that we had to wait. I weighed my options and decided to stay around for a little while. Otherwise, I'd have to pick up the money some other time. Just as I moved out of the queue, Karen and her goblin made their appearance. The woman had to be in her late 40s, early 50s, and her kid was around four. She already had this, I need the manager look about her, and when she heard what the young woman had said, she saw the opportunity to rant, and you can bet your butt she took it. She complained about how slow the cashier was, about the fact that she had been there for 40 minutes already, about how the cashier was probably so slow because she didn't know how to do her job. I tuned her out and went back to my game. When Karen noticed no one was paying attention, she went back to the queue, intent on getting her money, even if the system was not up and running. As I said before, the queue was huge, so it was a good 20 minutes before Karen got to the cashier. While we waited, her goblin ran around the place, screamed, and kicked the walls over and over, so much so that he left countless imprints of his shoe on the walls. Meanwhile, Karen said nothing and let her kid do as he pleased. An old lady tried to gently calm him down, but he simply wouldn't listen. Anyway, when Karen finally made it to the register, the conversation went like this. Karen, I am here to get my money. Cashier, I'm sorry ma'am, the system is still not working. I suggest you try again around 3 p.m. It was 12 p.m. The system should be up and running by then. Karen lost her mind right then and there. She started screeching. No, that is not happening. I'm not moving from this spot until I get my money. Cashier. Ma'am, as I told you, there's nothing I can do if the system isn't working. That's a lie. You are a liar. You don't know how to do your job. That's what's going on here. You are a new employee and you are useless and don't know how to do your job. Cashier, visibly upset. Ma'am, I've worked here for over a year and a half. I know how to do my job. If the system is down, there is BS. Why don't you restart your computer? Why don't you try to fix it? I want my money now. You probably want me to come back at 3 p.m. because that's when the other cashier clocks in and she, unlike you, knows how to do her job. By this stage, everyone in the queue was either baffled, angry, or a mixture of both. The guy behind her was livid. He walked up to Karen and told her to shut up and leave the cashier alone because she was no one to give her orders, especially when it was clear she had no idea what she was talking about. Karen didn't back down. I'm not shutting up. This woman has my money. I need the money because I have none left. Not even to pay for the bus back home or buy my son lunch. He is hungry and has been here for two hours already. Not true. Nobody seemed to care much about this, and they tell Karen to get out because she was holding everybody up. Seeing as the system was down and the situation was a sideshow, I put away my Nintendo, turned on my heels, and I started to walk out of there, towards the Starbucks cafe inside the agency. Just as I was walking out, I bumped into the same young woman who had let us know the system was down. Young woman, the system's still down, right? I nodded. Young woman. Oh, well, I guess I'll have to go to another Western Union to get my money. Now, I've been using Western Union for years, and I know its ins and outs. If the system is down, then every single Western Union agency won't be working. I told her that it was pointless for her to try and go somewhere else, and suggested that she wait like the cashier said, since it wasn't unusual for the system to fail every once in a while. Unluckily for us, Karen overheard. She had been kicked out of the queue, but still wasn't done. She made a beeline for us, ready to talk crap about the cashier. Karen, that useless jerk has no idea what she is talking about. How does she know that the system will be up and running by 3 p.m.? Is she a witch or something? I don't think so. She just doesn't want to do her job. How hard can it be to restart her computer? I felt my soul give a silent cry at this boomer not understanding how the internet works, but I still kept my cool and put on a smile. I explained to her that the problem was not the computer, 
but rather the system the computer was connected to. So restarting the computer wouldn't have solved anything. I also told her I've been using Western Union for years and that it isn't uncommon for it to fail sometimes, but that it will be up and running in a few hours. Still, Karen wasn't buying it. She was determined to think the cashier was a useless lump and she said so loudly. That was when I lost it. Me. Listen, the cashier did nothing wrong. There is a problem in the system. It's not working anywhere right now. What part of this do you not understand? But the woman didn't even... No, stop it. She did nothing wrong. You were in the wrong. You can't talk to people like that. You were rude. I kid you not, Karen gave me a death glare. And what do you know? You weren't here before. She made me wait for hours, and my kid is hungry, and I have no money to feed him. But what do you know about dealing with an upset child? She was right. I don't deal with an upset kid. I deal with 30 at a time, because I am a teacher. Anyway, after she said that, I told her it wasn't the woman's fault her kid was hungry or that she had no money for the bus. She still had no right to talk to the woman like that. Karen waved me off rolled her eyes, and said something about me not knowing crap. I smiled to myself, loudly clasped my hands, and said, Well, looks like being a jerk runs in the family. Karen stopped dead in her tracks and spun on her heels to face me, ready to attack. She started screaming at me that I have no idea what it was like to have a hungry child. I never got to hear the rest of her sentence because I was done with her. I had turned on my heels, marched into the nearby Starbucks, and slammed the door behind me, leaving a livid Karen talking to herself. Am I the jerk for refusing to let my sister and her kids move into the house that I bought? I'm a 32-year-old woman and I just bought my first house. It has three bedrooms, a yard, and is just what I need right now. I'm single and have two dogs. My sister is 34, has three kids, and lives in a two-bedroom apartment. Lately, she's been talking about how such a tiny living space is not enough for the four of them. When she got to know about the house I had bought, she became very upset and told me I was being wasteful as I'm single and don't have kids and therefore don't need such a big space. I reminded her that what I do with my hard-earned money is none of her business. She went on to complain to our mother about how selfish I was being. Yesterday evening, I got a call from my mom telling me I should let my sister and her kids move into the house. My house! I told her that no one was going to live in the house that I paid for but me, and that extra space would be great for my dogs to play in. My mom also got very upset with me and told me I was being unreasonable, that my sister's kids are growing and need the space more than my dogs. I offered to help my sister out financially so she could rent a bigger place. My mom got my sister on the phone who shot down the idea, telling me I needed to let her and her kids live in my house. When I refused again, she very generously suggested a compromise. I could live in the house with her and her kids and would not have to find somewhere else to live. She said this as if she was doing me a favor. I told her that she had lost her mind and hung up. Am I the jerk or is she? I know my sister is struggling financially, but this kind of entitlement is ridiculous. Well, what do you think? Should OP let Karen and her kids move in or not? Please let us know. Of course she should. They need that space much more than her and her dogs. Mom wanted me to give my sister my house, and sister says I stole her dream. When me and my husband decided to move, we wanted to live on our own spot of land instead of the cookie cutter community and no HOA. The house was still mortgaged. It was a two story, five bedroom, and three and a half bath house, and was less than a year old. Me and my husband at the time had no kids, only two dogs, and while we loved the house, the taxes and HOA fees and maintenance was really annoying to us and overly priced, and we wanted a little more privacy too, because our neighbors were literally two feet away from our own house. We were at a small family gathering with my parents and siblings discussing our options about where we wanted to move to and if we wanted to build or buy a temporary mobile home to save up for our true dream house. I noticed my sister pull my mother aside and were whispering about something, but I ignored it as my dad was telling us about some great opportunities in some nice country-like areas which was what we were hoping for. I always wanted to raise sheep and chickens and needed an area that would allow that. Later that night, my mom and sister asked if they could speak to me privately, which was never a good sign, but I sighed and we went into my mom's room and closed the door, which made me anxious. Listen, honey, 
Me and your sister have been talking, and we were thinking it would be a really good idea if you sold your house to your sister. She has three kids, and the house she lives in now is so small. This would be a major help to her and her family. My mom was using a tone like someone would use for a five-year-old. I was 33 at the time. That's not a problem. She just needs to go through the proper channels like everyone else. I can get you in contact with our realtors easily, and you can take it from there. Thinking she wanted to buy the house legit. No, no, you don't understand. My sister whined as she looked at my mom all teary-eyed. She would do this so my mom would take pity on her, and apparently they had discussed this before coming to me. Honey, your sister's credit isn't good enough, so she would never qualify for such a big loan to buy your house. So, we were thinking that maybe you could transfer the house into her and her husband's name, but you could keep paying the mortgage, and your sister will pay you under the table what is owed. That way, she can get the house, and you won't be losing any money over it since she'll be paying you back after all. Still talking to me all sweet like, what, are you kidding me? Do you have any idea what the mortgage is? It's $2,500 a month and you and your husband barely make 25K a year. That's when he actually has a job and you don't work at all. Not to mention the $1,500 land taxes and the $800 HOA fees. I understand you want a better place, but I know for a fact there would be a month you would fall on hard times like you always do and not be able to pay for that month. And I can't afford to keep you there if you don't pay, which we both know will eventually happen. You need to buy this house legit or not at all. I'm not making any kind of deals because we need to sell the house to buy our new place anyway. I was about to leave, but my sister burst into tears at this. Mommy, me and husband will work really hard to pay you every month, I swear. We need this place because we would never be able to get a place like this on our own. This is our only chance. She began crying again at this. You need to stop being so selfish. You and your husband are in the living room bragging about building a house and getting your own land and everything, knowing your sister is having so many financial difficulties and raising three kids. My mom is yelling at me. Exactly my point. She is always struggling financially. How can she afford $2,500 a month on mortgage alone? I would eventually end up just paying her mortgage all the time because her husband always changes jobs and I simply can't afford it. And since the house would be in her name, then I would have no way to kick her out. Eventually, I would have to stop paying and the bank would repossess the house and I would be left with nothing financially, which we need to fund getting a new place, not to mention damaging my credit score, which I worked very hard to make good. Harsh, yes, but the truth often is. I can't believe you are doing this just to spite me. You are stealing my dream and not even giving me something in return. She began to whine even more. What are you talking about, stealing your dream? I was really confused. I was always the one who wanted to buy my own little spot of land and build a house. You were talking about raising chickens and planting a garden. Those were my dreams, and you were stealing them, you selfish jerk! She yelled. Oh, wow. Imagine that. I want to be a homemaker? You were the only one in the world who wanted that. I guess mom stole your dream too, right? She owns land and a house and gardens all the time. And oh my god, our other sister does too. And she raises chickens. We all stole your dream. I was being overly sarcastic because it was so ridiculous. That's different. They're older than me, but you're younger. You shouldn't upstage your older sister like this. Just because you and your husband make more money than us, it's not fair. She was still crying and making a huge scene, but I was done with this at this point. The answer is no. You want the house, you can buy it legit, not under the table, and certainly not me footing the bill and losing a ton of cash that I know inevitably will happen. And I'm not stealing anything from you. If I want a little plot of land to grow a garden on and raise chickens, that's my choice, and you have nothing to do with how I live my life. If this is such a reasonable request, mom, then why don't you buy her a house legit? Put it in her name and just let her pay you under the table instead of asking your daughter to take care of her sister. She is your child, not mine, and I will not spend my hard-earned money supporting her and her family. Sister was throwing a huge fit after that crying and begging my mom to make me do this like we were still little kids or something. It was a pretty sad sight to see her throwing a tantrum like a two-year-old. Yeah, and she's the golden child, really? I told my husband we needed to leave and we spent the drive home with me telling him what my mom and sister were trying to pull over on us. He responded, Even if you did agree, did she really think I would go for it? I like your family and all, but wow, your sister is something else altogether. Stealing her dream? What was that all about?
he asked as we laughed about it a little. We have our own land now and are living in a double wide trailer that we love. Five bedrooms and three full baths and thankfully no stairs, no HOA, much cheaper mortgage and taxes and wonderful privacy. My sister has moved twice within the last two years and is always renting because their credit is terrible and they can't get a loan to buy a house. I just heard from my mother that they've been sending them money almost monthly for groceries because they can barely afford to buy food. Yeah, and you think she could have afforded that mortgage? I don't regret my decision one bit, and I love my little vegetable garden that I make homemade soup with often. What would you have done in this situation? Would you have sold the house to her under the table, knowing she wasn't going to be able to pay you for it? Or not? Please let us know. My younger sister upstaged me once, but she's no longer around to tell about it. <laughs> yes. Newly hired youth minister got me kicked out of church. I found out about him and the deacon's wife, so I helped the deacon ruin his life. About six to seven years ago, I was a ministerial student at a Baptist college. I had attended the same Baptist church since I was a small kid. It was large, about a thousand members, but not a mega church. This church had been an enormous part of my life for as long as I could remember. I played piano for a youth choir, preached at the children's church service, which was held in the church's chapel and at the same time as the adult service, drove the church bus to pick up Sunday school students, etc. I did all of this for free, not even getting reimbursed for expenses. During my senior year in college, we got a new Minister of Music, Education and Youth. This guy was as charming as an ice cream sundae with razor blades in it. I'll call him Mr. Charming. All the deacons and their wives thought he walked on water. He was an authoritarian jerk. In his first meeting with the church youth group, he announced that he had been hired to straighten out the youth group. One of his favorite sayings was, When I tell my disciples jump, the only questions they ask are how high and how far. The adults loved him and the youth hated him. Within a few weeks, half of the high school and college students, i.e. all of those without parents in the church, had quit coming to church. Most youth directors would have gotten into trouble over this, but he had the audacity to proclaim in front of the entire congregation in the Sunday morning worship service that he had eliminated all of the thorny ground from the youth group, a reference to the parable of the sower in the Bible. And the pastor and all of the deacons loved him for it. He didn't waste any time going after what he really wanted, the pastor's job. The pastor, whom I'll call Pastor T, was about 60 years old. Within a few weeks of Mr. Charming's arrival, rumors started circulating about Pastor T's health. He was an avid runner and cyclist and that he just didn't seem as mentally sharp as he used to be. He frequently quoted long Bible passages from the pulpit entirely from memory without misstating a single word, sometimes in Greek or Hebrew. None of these accusations made any sense, but people kept talking about them. I have no idea why the pastor didn't find out, or maybe he did find out and was just too scared to do anything about it. This was a Baptist church, and some denominations, like Catholic or Methodist, the denomination assigns pastors slash priests, not Baptists. Each church calls the minister. This guarantees that every pastor always walks on a razor's edge, the slightest slip, and you're out. You don't even have to slip. Maybe you even do the right thing and it still offends enough people. It doesn't take many, just a handful if they hate you enough. Then you're out. Or maybe, like Pastor T, some creep just lies about you and gets your job. And since the church often owns your house, your entire family is suddenly homeless and destitute. Then I became a target. I still don't know why. A couple of months after starting to work for my church, Mr. Charming called me and informed me that my services were no longer needed at youth choir, children's church, bus ministry, anywhere. In fact, he said he did not even want me to participate in any of these functions at all, not even go to the Sunday morning worship service. I later found out that members of his family had been hired by the church at very nice rates of pay to perform these functions that I'd been doing for free. His wife got paid more for playing a beat up piano at the one hour youth choir rehearsal than the main organist slash pianist got paid for playing for adult choir rehearsal plus Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. The wife could barely pick out the notes on the piano. This lady radiated bitterness, resentment, and repressed anger, but she rarely said anything. She just sat there and glared, which was somehow even creepier than when she spoke. I was very hurt, emotionally, so I dropped by Pastor T's office and tearfully asked him what I had done wrong. I couldn't get a straight answer, except he told me that people are saying things about me and that if I wanted to get a good recommendation from him to our denomination's Baptist minister school, I had better shut up and do what I'm told. So I started asking all of my church friends what people were saying about me. Everyone. 
every one said, Well, I didn't want to tell you, and I don't believe it, but here's what I heard. According to the rumor mill, I had gotten my girlfriend pregnant and forced her to get rid of it. I hadn't even had a girlfriend since junior high, and I had been arrested, and my dad had to pay a bunch of money to hush it up. There were other rumors, but you get the idea. I did what Pastor T told me to. I never darkened the door of that church again. Except once, months later, see below. It hurt like heck. I'd devoted my life to that church since I was a kid. But I had to have Pastor T's recommendation to get into the minister school I wanted to go to and the pain was unbearable just driving by there. So I decided to keep my distance. But I started thinking about Mr. Charming. Anyone who was that evil had to have a past and it probably wasn't a good one. I knew that just before working for my church, he had worked at a large Baptist school in a small town about 50 miles away. That church was actually about twice the size of my church. So he had moved from a big church to the same job at a smaller church. A bad career move? Running away from something? Ah, there was something rotten in Denmark and it smelled like an opportunity for me. As luck would have it, one of my uncles and his family lived in that same small town, although none of my family attended Mr. Charming's former church. So I called one of my cousins, told her my story, and enlisted her as my co-conspirator. I'll call her Anne. The next Sunday morning, Anne and I attended Sunday school and worship morning at Mr. Charming's old church. Although Anne had never been a member of that church, it was a small town where everyone knew everyone, so she knew most of the people there. She started asking about Mr. Charming and got an earful. Every one of her friends said that Mr. Charming was a world-class creep. He would flirt with all of the girls in the youth group. He was over 40 years old and had a wife and three kids of his own. But just like at my former church, the adults loved him because he kept the youth in line. Our investigation went on for several weeks. After church was over, we would go to her house, have a delicious Sunday lunch cooked by my aunt, and then write down everything we had learned. By then, Anne's whole family were in on my investigation. They were as angry as I was about the way I had been treated and our weekly report made interesting lunchtime conversation. I was sure that all I had to do was drive a few of these ladies and their parents, friends of my aunt and uncle, down to my old church, let them tell their stories to the parents of some of the girls in the youth group, and Mr. Charming would become Mr. Unemployed. But it kept getting better and better, so I kept digging. And I really wanted to keep a low profile if I could, because I didn't want to upset Pastor T any more than I had to. He knew a lot of people in the denomination, and he could easily ruin my ministerial career before it even got started. Finally, after a month or so, Anne grabbed me by the sleeve and said, You've got to hear this. She introduced me to a well-dressed, very large guy, maybe 30 to 35 years old. I'll call him Fred. We slipped off into a Sunday school room where we would not be overheard. It turned out that Mr. Charming had had a multi-year affair with Fred's wife. Fred had kept his cool when he found out, talked with a lawyer, and had spent months gathering evidence, text messages, voicemails, emails, even photos and videos of them together. Finally, Fred confronted his wife. She denied everything, but the evidence was just too much. Fred told her he wanted a divorce, full custody of their kids, their house, his retirement money, his business, her engagement and wedding rings, everything, even the dog. She hired a lawyer, but laws and courts being what they are in this rural Alabama county, her lawyer told her that if the judge saw the videos, she'd be lucky if she ended up in a homeless shelter with all of her worldly possessions under her bunk in a garbage bag. Then Fred turned his attention to Mr. Charming. Fred still sincerely loved his wife, and he was convinced that Mr. Charming had deliberately ruined his marriage, taking Mr. Charming to court, suing him for loss of consortium, and otherwise making him legally miserable would take too long. This is Alabama. Many Alabamians prefer a more direct approach. In rural counties, the police and any jury of your peers will probably include people who have known you since kindergarten. So if you have a good reason for your actions and aren't too stupid about it, there are things that you can do. Fred scheduled an appointment with Mr. Charming in his church office, who did not suspect a thing because Fred was a deacon and his kids were in the church youth group. Remember that I said Fred was big? Six foot, six inches at least, 300 pounds, and if there was an inch of fat on him, he hit it well. Looked like he could pull up a 100-foot oak tree by the roots without breaking a sweat. Fred told me that he had brought several friends with him and, of course, the videos. One friend blocked the door, another unplugged the phone, a third one stood behind Mr. Charming and encouraged him to stay seated in his chair. Fred made Mr. Charming watch about 10 minutes of one of the videos, then calmly said, I'm going to stand here and watch you pack up your stuff, then you're going to walk out of this building, 
and never show your face in this town again, or we'll be back. Mr. Charming did as he was told. A month later, he had a new job at another church, my old church, and started ruining another whole set of lives, including mine. Fred actually did not know where Mr. Charming had gone. He assumed he had moved out of the state. He was surprised and gratified to learn that this scumbag was only 50 miles away. This had all happened just a few months before. Fred was still deeply in love with his wife. They were getting counseling and he hoped that they could save his marriage. But his hatred of Mr. Charming was still fulminating. Like Mount St. Helens a few minutes before the explosion, he presented such a face of restrained rage and vindictiveness that it scared me and I wasn't even the one he was mad at. The next day, Monday, I drove back up there and gave him a copy of the directory of my old church. It had addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses for pretty much every member of the church. I showed him the pages that listed all of the deacons and other church leaders, and I marked some of the church's major financial donors. I explained my situation with Pastor T and asked that my name not be mentioned. No problem, he said. The next Sunday, I could not resist visiting my old church to see how things were going. Mr. Charming was nowhere to be seen, nor was any explanation given about what had happened to him. One weird thing though, the pastor looked scared. His voice, usually resonant, loud, and almost musically baritone, trembled during the whole sermon. I slipped in just before the service started and made a point of sitting in the very front row, center pew. The look on his face when he saw me was worth all of my trouble. I didn't know it at the time, but Fred had gotten right to work and done a very thorough job. The whole church had gotten multiple anonymous emails with photos and videos of Mr. Charming and Fred's wife and various, well, compromising positions. Deacons and major donors had gotten emails plus express mail packages just for good measure. Mr. Charming and Pastor T had been left out. They didn't know anything until the phone calls started pouring in. After the worship service, it did not take long for my church friends to figure out why I was there. It was very gratifying. I was something of a hero, although I kept swearing that I had no idea what they were talking about. Things continued to blow up in my former church for months afterwards. Both Pastor T and the pastor of Mr. Charming's old church almost lost their jobs because they had lied to my old church's committee of deacons who had recommended hiring Mr. Charming about why Mr. Charming had left his old job. But somehow, they managed to stay in the pulpits at their churches, although a lot of church members left my former church, which caused some financial problems. There was talk of legal action for sending all of this stuff to little old ladies and other people in the church, but nobody was ever able to prove that Fred did it. I don't think they tried very hard. After all, his wife was in the videos and photos. Both churches really did not want this to become a court case because of Mr. Charming's trysts and the fact that he had spent years with the deacon's wife while he had unlimited, unsupervised access to dozens of the church youth, which then became a matter of public record, so they hushed it up. I never saw Pastor T again. I had lost all of the trust and respect that I had had for him, and I was sure that he had figured out that I was somehow connected to the whole fiasco, so my chances of having a Baptist preaching career were precisely zero. By that time, being a pastor like Pastor T was the last thing I wanted anyway. I withdrew my application to the Baptist Minister's School and eventually completed a doctorate in archaeology at a different grad school. I've been teaching at a large public university in the Midwest of the USA with summer gigs on archaeological digs in Europe, and I am very happy. One last, very gratifying event, the reasons for this post. All that happened six to seven years ago. Fast forward to last March. I went to pick up a friend at a large downtown urban bus station in the US. Everyone hates this place. Not only is it crowded, it's also poorly maintained and filthy. It smells like spoiled garbage mixed with diesel exhaust and seldom cleaned public restrooms. My friend's bus was late. I stopped by the newsstand to get myself a soda and candy bar. Who do you think was restocking the shelves? Mr. Charming. I just sat across from the newsstand and enjoyed my drink and snack. He recognized me, then turned away. I just sat and watched him, restocking shelves full of magazines and junk food. Revenge is a feast that is best enjoyed cold. Entitled parents try to kick me out of my room. I'm currently taking classes away from home, and since I don't like the idea of living out of my car, I rented a room at a nearby bed and breakfast that houses students. Great owners, amazing rooms with private bathrooms, fast Wi-Fi, free use of state-of-the-art kitchen, and above all else, affordable. Of course, because the place I'm staying at is a B&B first, the owners request that I stay flexible during tourist seasons, which means I keep things at a ready-to-move status. 
Tourist patrons pay way more to stay here, so they take priority over room choice. Thankfully, tourist season only lasts from September 1st to October 22nd and from February 1st to the 18th and doesn't come without compensation. The owners have temporary rooms in their private residence. They call it the retreat, set up for students who have to move for tourists, as well as a contract stating that if any items left in our rooms are damaged or stolen by tourists, it will be fixed slash replaced. Well, it's tourist season again, thanks to the nearby town's winter and Valentine's festivals that happen every February. I've been moved once so far, but it wasn't too bad. The owners called all the students into the common room to explain the room situation for the coming days. Alrighty then, housemate one and housemate two, you're gonna stay the night up at the retreat. OP, you're the lucky one who gets to stay this time. Mind your manners and just do what you do. Later that day, I'm playing on my Xbox when I'm caught off guard as my door swings open and a family of three pour in. The lady sets down a couple of luggage bags while the kid starts running around the room. The mother takes one look at me and says, I was told that you'd be moved out by now. Why are you still here? I politely tell her that they may have the wrong room and that mine wasn't selected for patron use. That's ridiculous. I specifically requested this room. You better leave now or I'll be having a strongly worded conversation with the owner. I ask her to give me a second as I call up the owner. She gives me a, <clears throat> whatever. The owner picks up and I double check with him about my room. He confirms that they have the wrong room and that he'll be there shortly to work it out. I relay this information to the mother who just doesn't accept this. This is stupid. I asked for this room and I paid the fee. So you got to leave now. The kid finally notices my Xbox. Awesome, we have an Xbox while we stay here. Can I play it mom, please? The mom agrees, totally ignoring the fact that she has no right to allow her kid to use someone else's things. I keep the controller away from the kid and say that if I'm leaving, I'll be taking my Xbox with me. Her brat did not like that answer and began to wail like a banshee. Now look what you've done. You've made my baby cry. He's going to be in a bad mood for the rest of our stay now. You better hope the owner is forgiving because he's getting an earful when he shows up. All this is going on and not a word has been breathed from the dad. He just stands behind his wife, arms crossed, and with a mildly discomforted look on his face. The owner finally shows up, and it goes like this. Hello, folks. Sorry for the mix-up. Your room is taken up by this punk. We know. But this is the room I asked for, and it's the room we are getting, or we'll find somewhere else. Ma'am, your bill states that you asked for room number four. This is room number five. I've already made the arrangements for room four to be used, so if you could just please follow me, we'll get your family set up. No, this room has an Xbox video game entertainer. Yes, she called it that. And my son wants to use it while we stay here. It's this room or nothing. You'll be hard pressed to find another place with vacancy during the festival. Besides, it's just down the hall and it's just as nice of a room. Does it have an Xbox? I don't think. Then it's this room, or we take the Xbox with us. I interject, saying that no one is taking or using my Xbox without my permission. Why do you even have that thing anyways? You look like an adult, act like one, and quit playing childish video games. Ma'am, it's room four or nothing, and I can assure you, it's not going to be easy to find a new place to stay. Even if you did, it won't be as nice as here. Fine, I'll take it, but don't expect a review over three stars. She stomps out of the room, wailing brat and pack mule husband in tow. The owner gives me a yeesh look before apologizing and closing the door. That was two days ago, and they're still down the hall from me for another two days. The kid has had at least four very audible temper tantrums since then. God have mercy. Do you check everyone's cart like that? I work at a warehouse chain that requires a membership to shop, and I'm trained in a variety of departments. One of them is front door asset protection. We check receipts at the door of the store. This is not so much to prevent theft as it is to prevent shrink from cashier error. 99% of people are cooperative, even when there is a mistake on their receipt. Cast. 
We've got me. We've got customer service desk employee one, a close friend of mine. We've got customer service desk employee two. We've got rude lady and rude lady's friend. The story. Today, I was scheduled the closing shift checking receipts at the front door. I should mention that the industrial heater we have near the front door of the store is broken at the moment, so it was around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 7 degrees Celsius, at the door all day. Barely warmer than the current temperature outside. I was bundled in three layers, a hat and gloves, to barely stay warm for five hours, so I wasn't in the best mood. Rude Lady and Rude Lady's friend come up to me from the cashier service desk with a receipt and a carriage with three items in it, a case of water and two bunches of bananas. They hand me a receipt, which clearly says non-member where the membership number and info would usually be. This means they don't have a membership with the chain and aren't supposed to be shopping at all, but someone made an exception and let them purchase a few items. They hand me the receipt and I start to look it over. There's only one item on it the water. So I ask very nicely, do you have another receipt? This actually happens quite a bit. People forget they did two separate transactions and only hand me one receipt. Also, if we suspect theft, which I never did throughout this entire exchange, we are required to ask if they have another receipt as a neutral way to start a conversation about a missed item. Rude lady. Nope. Why? Me. It looks like only your water was charged on this transaction, but not the bananas. Rude lady yelling out of nowhere. Well, I paid for them. Do you check everyone's receipt like this? Me. Yes, I do. I show her the receipt, trying to indicate that only the water is on there. Oh, so you count all the items in all the cards? Go ahead, ask the lady at customer service. She knows I paid. I page customer service to the front door. They're only about 20 feet away, so it doesn't take long. Customer service one comes over. Hi, can I help you? Rude lady's friend. Uh-uh, she didn't help us. That other girl did. Customer service two was with another customer at the moment, so she couldn't come over. I quickly explain the situation to customer service one, who relays the information to her colleague at the desk and awaits an answer. Customer service two. OP, she paid for those. She must have lost her receipt but I did ring her up for them. Rude lady's friend. See? Rude lady. This is ridiculous. Do you really count everyone's card like this? Me. Yes. No, you don't. You know how I know? The guy in front of me had a full carriage of items, and you definitely didn't count all of them. At this point, I don't even know how to respond. Obviously, three items is a different situation than 50. When she had cut me off, I was actually about to explain how we are trained. If it's a small order, try to count everything. For larger orders, it's more common sense. Look for big items or items hidden underneath the carriage and verify a few smaller items in the carriage. The exception is large business orders, which we do have to check pretty much everything, no matter how long it takes, especially if tobacco is involved. Rude lady, glaring at me. You can give my receipt back now and help the next person. Me, starting to lose my patience. Ma'am, I'm just doing my job. Rude lady and her friend glare at me one last time and leave the store. Later, I found out from customer service too that rude lady had the receipt for the bananas on her. As in, it wasn't left at customer service when she checked out, but for some reason lied to me and said she didn't. She made a giant scene at the front of the store and backed up the line to get out for quite a while. Above all else, it's pretty simple. If I can clearly see that there are three items in front of me and the receipt only shows one, of course I'll ask. If I let her go without verifying, I could have been in huge trouble with the asset protection manager. I wasn't trying to accuse anyone of theft. Like I said, most of the time mistakes like this are cashier error. I am most definitely not an Uber driver. As the title says, I am not an Uber or a Lyft driver. There is no indication anywhere on my vehicle that I would be. I don't really put stickers on my truck anyway, so it's not like there's any confusion on this. I drive a 2014 Silverado and I take care of it and keep the inside looking nice. And from some of the horror stories I've heard, I don't want to let strangers in my truck. Nothing against Uber or Lyft drivers, just not doing it in a vehicle I worked very hard to be able to buy. Anywho, yesterday I drove my wife to Ulta so she could shop for beauty products. I really had no interest in going in, so I parked and played on my phone for a bit. 
After about 15 minutes, the passenger door opens and some stranger gets in. This lady looked like she walked straight out of a meme about Karens and hopped into my truck. Random lady. No wonder I was waiting so long. You're over here messing around. Me. Uh, I think you're in the wrong vehicle. I don't know you. Why are you in my truck? Random lady. I need to go to this address. It's down by the amphitheater. Me. I'm not a cab. You're the Uber driver I just called for. You have the sticker. I look around. I totally have friends that would put something on my truck as a joke, but I wasn't seeing it. Ma'am, you must be seeing things. There is no sticker on my truck. I'm not an Uber driver. Random lady pulls out her phone and with a tone of such superiority that I immediately wanted to just push her out of the door, says, My app says that the driver will be in a blue Ford Focus, and that's you. I laughed out loud. What is so funny? Me. I'll tell you what. I'll give you a free ride to the eye doctor to get you some glasses. You said your driver was in a blue Ford Focus, a small car, and you confused it with a dark gray Chevy Silverado pickup truck? And no possible trick of the light could those two ever get mixed up. You obviously need glasses, Mrs. Magoo. I'm sure everyone is about to be shocked by her next line. I've read enough Reddit stories and even written one or two. I should have seen this coming. How dare you? Me. I'm not your Uber driver. I don't drive for Uber. There is no sticker. You got into the completely wrong vehicle. The only thing that I can see as a reason is that either your eyesight is terrible or you're starting to come down with Alzheimer's or dementia, which would be tragic, but I don't think this is the case. I was watching the Karen rage build up in her face. I was expecting the explosion, but she switched tactics on me. I thought she was gonna zig, but she zagged. Random lady. Well, I still need a ride, and you aren't doing anything, so why don't you just take me there? I can give you five dollars. She said this like she was trying to bribe a kid with a piece of candy. I might have been willing to give her a ride. I'm a nice guy to most people, and generally am willing to help people out. However, her condescending tone got under my skin, and I'm not going to reward that kind of behavior. Me. No, and you need to get out. My wife is here. She had just shown up. This lady had the audacity to roll down the window and tell my wife, You can wait. I need a ride. It was that moment too that I just happened to see a blue Ford Focus driving really slow in front of the stores and the driver looking around. Obviously her ride. I started speaking slowly while keeping an eye on the driver. Ma'am, listen. Pause for dramatic effect. I am not driving you anywhere. I'm taking my wife home and she definitely doesn't have to wait for you. You need to get out of my truck before I call the police. If you're waiting for your ride, you need to settle that with Uber. By the way, the Uber driver you were waiting for is leaving the parking lot right now. I pointed to the blue car that was moving to the lot's exit back onto the road. She flung my door open and tried to go chasing after him. It was pretty comical, really. We drove past her on the way out. She didn't look happy. Speaking of Uber, have you ever used Uber? And if so, did you like it? Please let us know. Only when I have to, but I never give them a tip. Am I the jerk for telling my son he's the reason we're getting divorced? I know upon reading the title alone, many of you will just call me the jerk, and you may be right, but I want to explain myself first. My wife and I have been together since we first met in high school. We were able to maintain a long distance relationship throughout college and stay true to each other. I truly thought we were inseparable. She gave birth to a boy 12 years ago, and since then, things have changed drastically. My son unfortunately has behavioral problems and it's been very difficult raising him. He throws temper tantrums, gets in trouble in school frequently, refuses to listen to my wife and I. As a result, my wife and I started having disagreements about how we should handle him, i.e. whether to punish more, let him get his anger out, etc. This created a wedge between us that kept getting wider. We both resorted to drinking more and wanting to be away from each other as much as possible to get some relief. We started having more arguments and eventually it became so obvious that our marriage was deteriorating that family members started questioning it. So the topic of divorce came up and we both decided to go through with it. When I first told my son about it, he cried endlessly, then started throwing fits about how unfair it was. I completely understand that a divorce is hard on any kid, but the intensity of his fits kept growing. Since my wife and I are separated, not yet divorced, and because she can't tolerate our son that much, we agreed that he gets to spend most of the week with me, unfortunately. So I see him a lot and have to put up with his yelling far more than she does. 
Last Friday, he started asking if my wife and I forgave each other, and I told him that the divorce is happening, like it or not. He starts crying, and I got mad and told him, Buddy, you want to know why we are getting divorced? Because of you. We were happy before you were born, but you always act bad and get in trouble. So stop arguing with me when you caused it. You have nothing but yourself to blame. This devastated him, and I did apologize, but I told him there was some truth to what I said. However, since then, he's been much more quiet and behaved. Even my wife, who was with him over the weekend, said he was much better. So yes, I think I am the jerk for telling him he was the reason we were getting divorced, but in some ways, I don't think I am, because maybe it was just something he needed to hear. Well, what do you think? Was it okay for OP to tell this to his son, or not at all? Please let us know. No 12-year-old ever needs to hear something like that. Here, OP, I've got something for you. How I destroyed a brewery. Nearly 20 years ago, I was a brewer at a brew pub. The owner was a complete lunatic and an utter jerk. Before I was hired, he had already purchased the brewery equipment used from a closed microbrewery. Problem is, it was literally four times larger than it needed to be for the size of the place, and to top it off, he was selling big three beers too. And it was a Pugsley system, brewers will know, but I made it work. Even got the stupid ring-walled yeast to behave, but I only need to brew about three or four times a month. I have worked at places we brewed that much a week, so I wasn't needed anywhere near 40 hours a week, and I was salaried, so he decided I needed to work night manager at least two nights a week to fill out my hours. That was fine, it was an easy gig. After our first year, he advertised a huge anniversary event with specials on food and drink. Food specials, commercial beer specials, and didn't even mention that we made our own, much less put anything on special. Idiot. Not too long after, I got my first vacation in over a year, and he was mad at me for insisting. But life was stressful, not least of which because my mom was in hospice, stage 4 cancer. But her condition was such that she said my wife and I should go, she'll be fine. So we went camping for a week. The day before our trip was to end, we got word she had passed. Two days earlier, my family didn't know how to reach us, only she did. We rushed home, six hour drive, and on the way I called my boss and told him what had happened and that I probably would not be on on Monday as planned. This was Saturday. I found out later from a bartender that he then complained at the chef that I was probably going to want more time off. I did, in fact, take Monday off, but I went in on Tuesday to do my night manager shift. Now, my mom's wishes were to be cremated, with no embalming, so by the time I got home, she was already cremated. So the memorial service was planned for two weeks later, right after Labor Day weekend. There was to be a memorial service Thursday and the interment for the family Friday, so I planned and made sure that the servers were full and I wouldn't need to brew for at least a week. That Wednesday, the boss comes and tells me he wants me to work night shift on Thursday and Friday, normally I did Tuesday and Wednesday nights, to make up for the time off I'd taken to help my dad out. He wasn't handling it well. He wanted me to come in after my mom's funeral. I flatly refused, at which point he said, fine, but I'd have to work a double shift Saturday then. I nearly lost it. I walked away and after I cooled off, I went back and told him I was no longer going to do the manager shifts and that I wanted to switch to hourly for brewery work only. He was angry, but stuck. He needed me in the brewery. Things started calming down, but after a few weeks, I noticed my paychecks were far less than I anticipated. I hadn't been tracking my clock in slash clock out very closely, because prior to this, I only clocked in and out, so I was logged in to do manager functions. But I happened to have a couple of slips in my wallet, and because I still had manager access, discovered he had been altering my hours, eventually cheating me out of around 20 hours in just 6 weeks. And that's when I hatched my plan. I was done with this jerk. Remember that ringwood yeast? Well, in a brewery, you harvest yeast from a fermenting batch to use to brew a later one. And since we were slow, it often had to be stored for a while before it got used. But you had to use it within 30 days, 21 is better, or it goes sour and starts dying. Normally, I would take other steps to ensure it stayed clean and healthy, but not on the last batch I harvested. It just went into the cold room and stayed there. I stopped going in very often, just logging tank levels to make sure nothing ran out and made him suspicious. I would even go in to make sure he wasn't in that day and later message him that I had brewed. I hadn't. And waited. On day 45, after I got the check for the last hours I worked, I overnighted my keys in with a resignation letter. He called me the next day, screaming. I told him I knew what he had done, and I wouldn't be back. I don't know what he looked like, 
but when he went into the brewery cellar and discovered he had empty fermenters, nearly empty serving tanks, dead yeast, and almost no grain, pity really. After that, he tried to hire my former assistant, who was working at another brew pub by then, because the jerk had forced me to fire him to save money. He laughed at him. He then apparently got the son of one of the brewers at a nearby brew pub, which he had originally been part of to brew for him, but had to fire him because this guy kept getting drunk down in the cellar. So he tried doing it, and I had heard he had stopped brewing entirely eventually. About a year after I left, he folded. Staff showed up one morning to padlocked doors. Drove through there a few years back, not only gone, but building was torn down. I felt like stopping to sow the ground with salt, but I was in a hurry. Speaking of beverages, what's your favorite drink of all time? Please let us know. Wine is pretty much the only thing I drink. Gives me the kick I need to take on the managers. Am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend she has to get a real job after she spent our food money on makeup? I'm a 21-year-old male. My girlfriend, who's 19, quit her job at a grocery store a couple of months ago after her best friend decided to unfriend her. She was pretty sad about it, and I kind of understood why. I never really got the full story, other than that they lived together, and she admits to have been taking advantage of her financially sometimes, and being rude because she was tired from work. Needless to say, the friendship ended. She got all depressed, quit her job, literally just didn't show up ever again. And this is also my work, by the way. I still work here as a cart boy, I make minimum wage and work 35 hours a week on average. She doesn't have the best relationship with her parents, so she lives with me and my parents. My mom doesn't really like her, but my girlfriend does help around sometimes. She makes me dinner some days and does some of the laundry. She decided she wanted a cam girl, and she's made some, but not much. I wasn't comfortable with the idea, but we needed money and she didn't want to work. My parents just let us live here, but we pay for our own food and I pay my mom some money in rent not nearly the cost of a real apartment. I pay her phone bill sometimes when she doesn't have enough and buy her food and myself food as well. She spent a lot of her time drinking and blazing. I do too, but she's home all the time, so. And she worked for two days at a store near us and blamed it on them when she wouldn't want to work anymore. Anyway, I didn't have much money. Given I only get about 300 to 280 a week, my store is a union and we have to pay union fees weekly. I gave her some money. I don't remember if I told her it was for food, I probably forgot, but she spent it on makeup and sent me pics about it. I got furious. She spent all of our food money on makeup at CVS. I told her I was sick of this and that she needs to get a real job with real income because I cannot continue paying her bills, mine, food, and all this other stuff. She started crying and said I was insensitive and a jerk because she's depressed. And I said she could just get a job, then afford therapy sessions, and how I'm depressed too, but I still go to work. This has been happening for six months. We've only been dating for nine. Am I really a jerk? She won't talk to me and locked herself in our bedroom. Well, what do you think they should do? Should his girlfriend get a different job? Should they stay together or split up? Please let us know. Mm, lace up those Nikes, OP. It's time to run. Listen, lady. This is a barber's, not your credit union. So I'm getting my hair cut today in Dublin, Ireland, chatting away to my barber, who's also a maid. It's a slow day, so there's only me, barber one, who's cutting my hair, and barber two in the shop. We're talking about lockdown and crap when an older woman, say late 50s, early 60s, Karen, walks in and asks about the credit union up the road. The following conversation takes place. Karen, sorry boys, but do you know when the credit union opens? Barber two. Oh, that one has been closed for a few months now. The nearest branch is about a 10 minute drive away. Why did they close? Haven't a clue. Sorry. Well, this is ridiculous. First they closed the one in the shopping center, and now this? How am I to get my money out? Barber 1. They moved to a bigger building down the way. Barber 1 provides detailed directions. I've just come from that way. You're telling me I have to drive back now? Only if you want to get your money out. Karen gets agitated and raises her voice. This is a disgrace. I'm going to withdraw my money and cancel my account and put it all in the post office. Barber 2. Whatever. Credit union is that way. Have a good one. Did they even consider how inconvenient moving buildings would be for their customers? Yeah, they did. And they explained everything in the email and letter they sent to their members. My ma'am is with that credit union and she's known for weeks. Now can you please leave? I'm cutting this lad's hair. That's a lie. I've been a member for years and got no warning. It's not a lie. Now please get out. Who do you think you are, talking to me like that? 
I think I'm a barber, and I know this isn't a credit union. Now get out. Karen leaves and mutters. Unbelievable. I'll be calling the owner to complain about your attitude. Barber 1. Make sure you call the right barbers, you dope. And end scene. We had a really good laugh about it and felt really sorry for any credit union staff unfortunate enough to cross our path. Would I be the jerk? My son's father and I already agreed on a name, but I want to pick a new one without his input. My ex and I were together for nearly three years. I found out I was pregnant when I was already 12 weeks along and my ex was excited to be a dad and he couldn't wait for the baby. We picked out names. I wasn't a massive fan of the boy name he chose and told him so, but he said it's a family name and meant a lot to him, so I agreed to it despite having other options I liked more. Two weeks later, he told me that he wanted a paternity test. I said I didn't get where this was coming from, but I have nothing to hide, so okay. He then asked for one at my next appointment and they said the only option was amniocentesis, which slightly elevates the risk of miscarriage. I know it's only slightly, but I'd rather have no risk than a slight risk. I asked if there were other options, and they said that there's a different test they could do before the birth with no risk from the procedure, but they can't do it at the place I went for checkups, and my doctor said that me going to the hospital for the other test would pose an unnecessary risk just by going there, so they didn't recommend it. I said to my ex that if he wanted a paternity test, then we could wait until the birth, because I'm not putting the baby at risk with either of the in utero options. Because of this, my ex said that he wouldn't be involved until the paternity test comes in and proves he's the father, at which point he would be totally involved. Until then, I'm on my own. I'm now 37 weeks pregnant, and I've spent 23 of those weeks without him entirely. I've been thinking about the name a lot. I feel like we chose this name together, but I've gone through this whole pregnancy alone. I'm about to go through delivery alone, and despite what he said about wanting to be involved once we have confirmation, that's still not a guarantee that he'll actually be involved. We've already broken up over this, and I didn't like his choice of name that much to begin with. I want to pick another name. I'm staying with my parents and siblings, and I talk to my parents about it. My dad agrees with me and thinks I should choose something new because, in dad's words, my ex hasn't done anything to earn a say in this. My mom, however, and my sister both feel that I should go with the agreed on name because it was agreed on, and they feel this would hinder a healthy co-parenting dynamic. I think I might be the jerk because it's his baby too and the last thing I want to do is push him away when our relationship in general is already pretty crappy and this wouldn't be a good start to co-parenting as exes. Would I be the jerk for changing the name? Info. I don't know exactly why he wants a test but here's my thoughts. 1. He asked for the test shortly after telling his parents about the baby and his parents don't like me so they could have said or done something. Two. I have a few male friends who he doesn't like me spending time with, despite our time together being in a group of several people, even mix of men and women. 3. The pregnancy was 5 plus years ahead of schedule, so it was a shock to both of us. Bear in mind that all of this is pure speculation, because when I asked him why he wanted the test, he only said he needed proof, and he couldn't know it was his baby the way I could know it was mine. Well, what do you think she should do? Do you think she should go ahead and change the baby's name, or leave it as the old name? Please let us know. Change that name, OP. That boy don't deserve a say in nothing. Sorry, replacement. I'm not training you. This happened over 18 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I had worked for a law firm in a clerical role for about three years. Though not a lawyer, I ended up doing a lot of work that lawyers normally handled, but not for lawyer pay. Anyway, I would landed my dream job in another field. More interesting, better hours, better benefits, double the pay. I hit the jackpot and was on my second from last day at the law firm, having respectfully given and honored my two weeks notice. As it happened, I needed to take an extended lunch break one day to handle some business related to my pending new job. I arranged it ahead of time and even came in two hours early to make sure all my work was completed on time. Dang, I was too conscientious. Anyway, my lunch business took me longer than expected and I returned about an hour later than planned. No big deal, right? I had very little left to do and only two more days at that job anyway. Nope, the HR manager found me as I got to my desk, called me to her office and fired me on the spot. I managed not to smile and thank her because I was thrilled to have an extra couple days off before heading to my new position. I had a little spring in my step as I walked to my desk to pack up my stuff. I can neither confirm nor deny that I was whistling a happy tune. In truth, there was only one thing I still had needed to do on my final two days. Though not a lawyer, I essentially took care of all the estate planning clients, wills, advanced medical directives and such. 
I'd take all the info from the clients, generate all the forms, check the compliance with all the laws, and hand it to the attorney. He'd skim it, sign it, and bill his hourly rate for the hours I worked. It was a cash cow for the firm because I made next to nothing. Anyway, though I was good at the work, the files were rather a mess. Let's just say my system worked for me, but it was eclectic. As I was packing my desk, I left them piled in a box on the floor. Moments before I was preparing to walk out for the last time, the young attorney, yes, attorney, who had been assigned to take over that part of my work came up to my desk. He said, HR manager told me to come find you and have you show me the estate planning files. She said you'd show me what I need to do. I had the incredible pleasure of being able to look at him and say, with the most sincere and innocent tone, I'm sorry, I don't work here. Then I pointed at the pile of files and suggested HR manager would have to help him. Then I picked up my box of personal effects and walked away. And just as sweet as could be, poked my head into the HR manager's office on my way out to assure her that there were no hard feelings and to let her know that the young attorney was probably going to be looking for her. Stop making noise after 10 p.m.? Alrighty then. Some time ago, four years and change to be precise, my best friend and I moved into a nice house with a cool inner garden and a tiny living room looking out into it. We, 20 at the time, weren't really into partying, but as most university students still had some friends who would come over two to three times a month in twos or threes to hang out, bake, drink some wine and chill. Nice times. Once the weather got warm enough, we would sit in the garden and talk. And here, you'll just have to take my word that we were only talking once the clock hit 2200, as that's when the official night hours start around here. So, no shouting, not even the quietest of music, no more than four people having a chill conversation in their own backyard. Working and studying, mind you, doesn't leave much time for such luxuries, so again, that's no more than twice a month. Across the fence, there lived a just-no family, an older lady and her husband in one house, and her daughter, toddler, grandkids, and two small obnoxious dogs barking all day, every day, and the next, both sharing a garden bordering on ours. Two meter high concrete wall between us and them. Additionally, we had never met them in person until they started showing up at 2205, demanding that we go inside and close all windows so as to not be heard at all. Because otherwise, we are a great awful inconvenience, super loud, and an absolute breach of the rules. Not true, but the constant bickering, threats, and calls to the landlord spoiled any enjoyment of the garden and summer evenings for us. The final straw was when the husband appeared at 2202, so he had obviously been waiting to lecture us as to how we can be as loud as we want, but no later than 2200, because in this community, we have rules. Alrighty then, cue malicious compliance. Both of us enjoy a wide variety of musical genres, Jazz, blues, swing, classical, folk, the occasional pop or rap track, you name it, and rock and metal abundantly. So for the next two years, every evening with nice enough weather, the time from 2100 to 2200 became the neighborhood musical education hour. And at this point, it ain't jazz either and is as loud as we darn well please. We're having a blast unwinding from the day, incorporating all cooking and showering into a dance routine. Then, all music stops at the strike of 2200. Yes, we have an actual church with actual bells that rings even at the time of the night. And on and on, evening after evening, till the leaves start to fall and it gets too cold to blast some nice Ramstein or Pink Floyd or whatever through the huge living room window. They tried to complain to the landlord about it too, but at this point, he told them that they got exactly what they asked for and to buzz off. Only thing we hear from the other side of the fence nowadays is them screeching at their dogs, and they lived happily ever after. Homeless looking guy actually does work in the building. So, years ago, I got a pretty sweet gig working as a security guard, shift supervisor actually, important, a building downtown. It was a mixed use building, so we had a food court, retail stores on two levels, as well as five office towers. When I first started, one of the things all the guards are taught is to treat everybody they deal with respectfully. The building did have a lot of transients and homeless people wander through, but we prided ourselves on being courteous and polite to everyone. Well, one lazy Sunday morning, I get a frantic call from our building operator, guy who watches all the security cameras, telling me I need to get to a specific bank of chairs on the second floor. He's panicking and I can't make out much of what he's saying other than one of my guards' names. 
I go rushing over, worried about this guard who's a bit of a loudmouth bully and he might be in a fight or something. Oh boy, do I wish that was the case. When I get there, the guard is berating an older gentleman who is seated in one of the chairs. Guy has a pile of paper and a coffee on the table in front of him and is pretty shabbily dressed. A pair of threadbare jeans, dirty running shoes, a faded and stretched out t-shirt, and a leather jacket that has more scuffs than leather at this point. There's a ratty laptop bag on the floor leaning against the table. The guard is darn near purple in the face, screaming at this guy to get out, pointing wildly and yelling about how we don't allow pieces of garbage to live here. You've been here an hour. Move along. I walk up, tell the guard to cool his heels. Hey guard, let's all just take a breath. What's going on here? And then I greet gentleman in the chair and ask what seems to be the problem. The second gentleman gets two words out. Guard lights up on a tangent about how this homeless dude is loitering and needs to leave but won't get up. I shush him and try talking to the gentleman again and this time he got out four words before the guard interrupts again and this time starts threatening to literally flip the chair forward to toss the gentleman onto the floor. I finally have enough with the guard and tell him to go to the office and cool off and that I will deal with the gentleman. Guard begrudgingly leaves and I apologize to the gentleman about the guard's overreaction. Gentleman basically says, I appreciate it. I work in X Tower on X floor and forgot my keys. I was waiting till my assistant arrives and can let me in. I automatically offer to let gentleman into his office. We do all the time and have specific protocols for it and he accepts. So away we go to the elevator. We reach the floor and then doors open, which is when I realize where I am. Every single night, we patrol every single office space of every single tower except for one. On one floor, the entire space is occupied by a legal firm that is worth multi-millions and we aren't allowed in the office, ever. Yup, I'm standing on that floor. Gentleman steps into the floor lobby and I have to excuse myself to go and get the key for his office. We aren't allowed to carry a copy of it, so I can let him in and he just nods. I race down to the building operations room, snag the key and race back as fast as I can. When I get back to the floor, I open the office door and gentleman invites me in as he goes to shut off the alarm. I then have to awkwardly ask him for his ID and to see his office so I can verify that he's allowed to be there. He chuckles and obliges me. He's the owner of the legal firm. Thanks me for letting him in and I leave. About 20 minutes later, the president of our security company arrives on site with two other people and guard who blew a gasket is escorted off site. Fired. As soon as I left lawyer, he called the manager of the building at home to have words and manager then called security company who came down personally. I got a nice compliment for how I handled things and I learned why we had the rule of treating everybody with respect. Entitled parent yells at me for being good at laser tag. Cast. We've got me, we've got annoying kid, we've got entitled mom, we've got staff, and friend. Background. I was invited to friend's birthday and it was at a place with a laser tag arena and I'm pretty good at it. I arrived quite early to the birthday so I soon guaranteed my place in the line. It was the right move because there was a line to enter it and to make the line move faster the rules were free for all with about 10 people in the arena each time. And when you lost, you exit the arena and give your equipment to the next kid in the line. Once I was inside, I defeated some enemies and was still with all my lives. Everything was okay until I defeated annoying kid. He was younger than me and I had defeated him before. So he went through the entire line again before I defeated him the second time. Annoying kid after recognizing me. Hey, how are you here if I entered the line before you? Me. I simply didn't lose my lives. That's not possible. You're cheating. Me. Go and lie to someone else while running to get another enemy. So while I was running near the arena entrance, the door opened and the staff called me. So I exited the arena and went to see what he wanted. Staff. It's him? Annoying kid. Yes, it is. Entitled mom. Before I even realized what's happening. So? You're the one that's cheating and defeating my angel. Me. I'm not cheating. My son said that you are cheating. So yes, you're cheating. And I'm sure that if staff looks at your gear, he will see that you're cheating. Staff, let me check your gear. I give him the gear so he can check it. Staff tells entitled mom, nothing is wrong with his gear. Staff to me, you can go back in the arena. But he's been in the arena for more than 20 minutes and my angel stayed less than five minutes each time. 
But ma'am, the rules are clear. You're only eliminated when you're defeated, and he hasn't lost yet. But this isn't fair. He played more than my son. Ma'am, please calm down. I only work here. I'm not the one who created the rules. At this moment, I decide to return to the arena, where I stayed until Annoying Kid entered the arena again, and somehow convinced six of the other players to come after me. I had defeated some of them before. So seven kids rushed at me, and even though I managed to defeat four of them, including Annoying Kid, they were able to defeat me. At this point, I only had half of my lives remaining. So after that, I returned to the line and managed to return to the arena. But after half of the other players decided to go against me again, I decided to go and do something else. I just remember Entitled Mom and Annoying Kid looking mad at me every time they saw me. If you're wondering, Annoying Kid was only at the party because Entitled Mom was friend with Friend's Mom. Like some of the other kids, he was able to convince to attack me. So I had never met him before. Karen flips out that I won't get her a pair of shoes. Hello everybody, never expected to be posting here, so this just happened a few hours ago now, and I still can't get over the absurdity of it all. Since lockdown has happened, I've been going on walks every day so I can get exercise, also because I need to walk my dogs. I don't have a lot of shoes as I don't have a lot of money, and so I try to limit excessive amounts of stuff. Lockdown has been really relaxed in my country as the cases are only average. I recently sold some old tech so that I could get some money to buy some new shoes, as my old shoes have a few holes in the sole. I managed to make around 80 pounds from selling, and so I was going to buy some decent shoes that wouldn't wear out. Now to get into the story. I had gone to Sports Direct to get a nice pair of shoes, as I know they have some really good deals on at the moment near me. Now the uniform for Sports Direct is a black polo shirt with white stripes and the logo on the back an optional hoodie, and any pair of dark trousers or jeans, preferably black. I had decided to wear my Adidas polo shirt that my dad had given me, since it didn't fit him anymore, with a pair of maroon jeans along with my very worn out shoes. I had found a pair of walking boots that were pretty expensive and I was having a look at them, asked about them, but then found they didn't have my size, so I went to go put it back on the shelf. Enter Karen. Karen spinning me around by the shoulder. Excuse me? and that typical snotty tone. I've been waiting for ages for service. Now, do you have these shoes in a size six? Me, obviously alarmed. Sorry, can you please not touch me? And also, I don't know if this store does. I, Karen scoffing. What the heck do you mean you don't know if this store does? It's your duty to know. Now, go serve me and check to see if you have a size six. Me, no, it's really not. Also, where is your mask? It's mandatory to wear one in stores, you know. Karen. No, no, no. I can't wear a mask. I can't breathe. It covers my nose. How would I be able to breathe? Just get me my size 6 shoes already. Now, I was getting irritable at this point. I hadn't slept that well as it was too hot and I didn't have a fan. Oh, I forgot to mention. I'm only 15 and about 5 foot. Do you see a small problem? I have a baby face anyway. And sure, my mouth and nose was covered but I didn't look at day past 13 at max. Me, please miss, I'm 15 years old. I'm just here to get a pair of shoes for myself. Karen, almost hissing at this point. You, you liar. You obviously work here. I saw you put a pair of shoes back on the shelf and you're wearing the shirt. Don't you dare lie to me. Me, oh my God, I'm done with being polite. I've tried to tell you that I don't work here. I'm 15 years old and I'm a customer. How narcissistic are you that you think everything you think is right? Karen, mouth as wide as a snake's. How dare you speak to me like that, missy? I'll have you fired for that. Now, call your manager over with your radio. Me, looking down. Oh, look, I have no radio. Doesn't that indicate something to you? By now, the few people that were in the store were looking over, and an employee had come over. Employee, excuse me, what's going on, and how can I help? Karen, this disrespectful girl has refused to get me the shoe size I requested and is insulting me. I demand to speak to the manager and talk about getting her fired. Employee then looks to me, staring at me for a few seconds with a confused look on his face before he looked back to Karen. Employee, I'm sorry miss, but she doesn't work here. Also, where- No, no, no. You can't just cover for your friend when she did something wrong. Get me the manager. Karen went into an absolute tantrum, stomping her foot and not listening to anybody that tried to talk to her. 
Reluctantly, after a few seconds, employee walked off to find his manager. Karen noticed and then looked to me with a grin that looked like she thought she had won. The floor manager then came over about a minute later and at this point I found a pair of shoes that I was going to buy, so I was holding the shoe in my hand. Floor manager. Sorry miss, I was told to come over to resolve the issue, but I'm afraid I can't have you in the store without a mask. Do you have one on you? If not, you can buy one for two pounds. Karen. No, I won't wear one when I can't breathe in it. Now, do something about this disrespectful girl. Karen pointed to me. Floor manager looked to me holding the shoe, then turned his attention to me. Floor manager. Hi there, did you need something? Me. I had just come here because I needed a new pair of shoes. Do you have these in a size 5? I showed him the shoe and Karen went into an absolute frenzy. Floor manager completely blanked her and went on one of his devices to see what they had in stock. Karen was going ballistic yelling at me and the manager and the store, everybody. Floor manager. Yes, we do. Would you like to meet me at the counter? I'll get you the pair and box them for you. Floor manager had told employee to call the police to escort Karen out. And what ended up happening is that Karen not only got kicked out, she got fined for not wearing a mask too. I think she ended up going back to the police station and I ended up getting a small discount on my shoes for what I put up with. I was talking with floor manager and he ended up joking that I should work for them because of the shirt. I just need to get new trousers. That was the end of the story pretty much. I even had enough money to go to Subway nearby so I got myself a sub, cookie and a drink. I think I'll have to thoroughly clean my shirt though after Karen put her disgusting hands on it. Sorry this was so long, thanks for reading this all the way through if you did. Speaking of shoes, what are your favorite kind of shoes to wear? Please let us know. Flip flops with diamonds for the win, bruh. Am I the jerk for proposing to my girlfriend in a way she didn't like? I'm 34, male, and have been seeing my girlfriend, who's 28, for four years. We've talked about marriage and kids in passing. It's always been something we're both open to, but we're both quite career-minded, and that's been our focus. She and her brother both often joke slash complain about the pressure they feel from their parents to get married. He's been in a relationship longer than we have and is still not engaged and I've seen as well how it's something their parents drop unsubtle hints about all the time. I don't think they mean it to feel like pressure, they just want their kids to be happy, and they want to be grandparents. Anyway, I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I've reached that point in my life where marriage is increasingly appealing. I'm ready to make that commitment, and I know she's the one for me. Her parents hosted a dinner party to celebrate us all being able to finally visit each other's houses again. It was me, my girlfriend, her brother, his girlfriend, and our three sets of parents. It seemed perfect to me, so after dessert, I got down on one knee and proposed. She looked pretty stunned and said, Um, I guess. And everyone laughed. All the parents started celebrating. Her mother was crying. Her father was opening champagne. We were all hugging. We went home later, and I told her how happy I was to spend the rest of my life with her, and she started crying and saying she felt like she had no choice. This upset me. It was hardly the enthusiasm I had hoped for, and I asked if she loved me. She said she did, and maybe she did want to get married, but the way I proposed made it feel like her answer was a foregone conclusion and she didn't have time to think about it. And even now, she knows that if she were to change her mind, she'd be letting everyone down and disappointing her parents. She said she had wished I'd proposed privately, so we could talk together about what it really means and what our future looks like and she could be really 100% sure of her decision before announcing it to her family. She feels like I've removed her opportunity to prepare for her parents' reaction and make sure she was saying yes because she wanted to instead of because of expectation. She says she's less sure than ever about our relationship because the proposal shows how little I know her or what she wants. I thought I was being romantic, and even if it wasn't her ideal proposal, I don't see why that should affect her answer. Our relationship's about more than just that one evening. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is he a jerk for the way he proposed to her or not? Please let us know. A plus for effort, but you done goofed. Friend crank called me at my job, so I had him served with a fake paternity suit at his. Ten years ago, a friend of mine crank called me several times in my office over the course of a day. I decided in that moment that one, this would not stand, and two, rather than entering into a long, protracted quagmire of a prank war, I would use the nuclear option and end it immediately. My friend, Mike, was a well-known local bartender. I worked at the same bar as a bouncer, and he was very much enjoying single life at the time, facts which I knew I could take advantage of. Soon, a plan began to form. 
I would have him served with a fake paternity suit while he was working at the bar. So I compiled a ton of free online legal documents, not just for the paternity suit, but also income disclosure forms, statements of paternal rights, and suggested visitation schedules pending demonstrable proof of sobriety. I filled out all the forms, then smeared what looked like date received stamps as proof that they had been filed and ran copies to make those stamps even more illegible. From there, I crafted a backstory to be included in a cover letter from the fictional mother's fake law firm, the nearby city family law center on letterhead and all. The mother was an Irish exchange student visiting the area the previous summer. She had only been with Mike, so she knew the baby, Eliza, was his. The cover letter encouraged Mike to call during regular office hours to discuss arranging a DNA test to affirm paternity. I set up a generic voicemail for the number listed as the office on the letterhead. By the end, the paperwork was somewhere between 20 to 25 pages. I enlisted another friend not known by Mike to serve the documents and instructed him to do so around 10 p.m. on a Saturday evening. I told him to keep the interaction very simple. I wasn't able to be by the back bar because I knew I would be laughing way too hard. But based on eyewitness reports, it played out like this. Friend. Are you Mike? Mike. Yes. Friend. Is this your middle name and your last name? Mike. Yes. Friend drops the folder on the bar. Mike. What's that? Friend. Paternity suit. You've been served. Turns around and immediately walks out of the bar. Mike. Yeah, that sounds about right. Mike read through the packet shakily poured himself several drinks and then ran over to the bar owner who was aware of the prank to ask what to do he also called the number on the letterhead but sadly did not leave a voicemail after a solid 10 minutes of intense psychological revenge the owner finally told mike he should closely read the last page of the packet on it in size 2 font it read go forget yourself mike at which point mike ran to the front door and punched me in the chest epilogue Several months later, Mike was on a trip across the country. He had left his car at home with his mom, who generously had washed it for him. Mike, for some reason, kept the paternity suit paperwork in his driver's side door. During the course of the car wash, his mother found it and read the entire thing, then called him sobbing in the middle of the night, asking why he hadn't told her about her Irish granddaughter. Am I the jerk for not giving my mom two grand? When I was three, I was mauled by my aunt's dog. It was pretty bad and I have a pretty sick scar on my face from it. It was not only traumatic for me, but for my parents. My mom decided to sue her sister's insurance company since it was really expensive and this was not the first time this dog bit a family member. Anyways, the lawsuit ended. We won. I'll receive $75,000 when I reach the age of 25. My mom is currently asking me for two grand and I don't know if I'm the jerk for not wanting to give it to her. Here's my reasoning for not wanting to give it to her. Part of the settlement was for plastic surgery. Two grand was set aside for me when I was 10. I decided not to go through with plastic surgery. I learned to love my scars. My mom decided to take that money and gamble slash drink it away. Now that I have a kid of my own, if this happened to my kid, I wouldn't be asking for two grand from her since it was her traumatic experience and her money. My mom was a terrible mom during most of my life. My dad was pretty much the only one raising me. My dad isn't asking for money from me. My mom's reasoning for wanting the two grand. Suing her sister caused a rift in her family. She spent several days on unpaid leave taking care of me. It was a lot of work and stress on her suing her sister. I was going to give some money to my mom and dad anyways, but now since my mom is practically begging me for it, it makes me second guess if I should give it to her. My mom likes to remind me that my dad wasn't going to sue and that since she came up with the idea of the lawsuit, it makes her entitled to some of my settlement. But my thing is, that's something a good parent should have done. She thinks she should be rewarded for being a good parent for once in her life. Now my mom is angrily texting me and calling me horrible names, saying I'm selfish and if it wasn't for her, I'd have no settlement money. She's giving me a mega guilt trip. Honestly, I don't know if I'm being selfish or not. It is a lot of money. Anyways, Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Should OP give their mom $2,000 out of the $75,000 they're going to get or not? Please let us know. Maybe mom can just sue them for the money. She seems to be pretty good at it. We are permanently closed. Two years ago, I closed my repair business in a hurry. I had some family emergencies and it pulled me away from my business long enough that with refunds and being closed, I could not financially reopen. I was in danger of being evicted from both the retail space I was in and my house. Those that know me know I am a brilliant tech. 
one of my closest friends had his own business, serving arcades, movie theaters, stuff like that. He makes me an offer I couldn't refuse. I would make three times what my monthly income was what I averaged at my shop, plus he was going to pay me a large sum up front to make sure all my rent was paid up and I would not lose anything. Needless to say, I made an agreement with my landlord, put a permanently closed sign on the door and took the offer. Originally, I intended this to be temporary, so the shop has ended up sitting closed for two years. Then all this craziness started, but now it's slowing down and I'm finally getting the time to start selling off and packing up my shop. I'm in the storage room and I hear banging. I go outside and there's a couple standing there. The woman starts yelling as soon as she sees me. Lady, finally someone is actually here. I point to the sign. Lady, I've been here every week for two months. Why are you always closed? I point to the sign. Stop playing games and speak to me. I point to the sign and start to walk away. Lady, don't walk away from me. I need my wine cooler fixed. I'm losing money and wine every day it's down. I'm going to sue you for my losses. I walk back to the door and pull off the sign, watching her face get excited like she won. I yell through the door. We are permanently closed. I put the sign back up and yell, Who are you going to sue? This business has been closed for two years. It has no licenses, no employees. I'm just here to empty the suite. Maybe you could read if you drank less wine. The husband, who has been standing behind her the entire time, almost burst out laughing. You know she has probably dragged him there every week with her and had to argue with her about us being permanently closed every time. I was actually told later every other shop that worked on wine coolers in my area have either closed or quit serving them because they have such a high failure rate nobody wants to deal with them. Am I the jerk for telling my husband we can't take our daughter canoeing? This is so stupid. I can't believe I'm even posting this here because I'm sure I'm not the jerk. But my husband keeps bringing it up and making me feel like a jerk, so I figure I'll see what you guys think. Super short and simple. My husband's family is going canoeing on Sunday, and they want us, my husband, daughter, and me to go too. I told my husband that if he wants us to go, him and me, that's fine, but we need someone to watch our daughter. He's not happy about that. Context. Our daughter is only about 9 months old. My husband already cleared everything with the company that handles everything, and they said that they don't care as long as she has a flotation device. But even assuming that the weather holds up, that's still several miles down a river in a canoe. She's a tough little cookie, but that's a lot for her. As of right now, it's supposed to be sunny and over 80 degrees on Sunday, and she just doesn't do well in the heat, much less in the sun for long periods of time. I don't have a problem if my husband wants to go canoeing, but I don't think our daughter needs to go too, until she gets older. My husband says he agrees with me, but then he'll say things in passing like, well, if we're going canoeing on Sunday and we take our daughter, no, we're not taking her. End of discussion. Am I the jerk? ETA. A few different people have given me crap over saying, we're not taking her. End of discussion. I get that, but that conclusion was come to after my husband and I had discussed this situation at length for weeks. Initially, I was on board with the idea. Boat pun unintended. But as time went by, I got more and more uncomfortable. Safety issues included, who's going to take care of her? Me. Who's going to keep her entertained? Me. Who's going to try to keep her shaded and cool since she's extremely fair-skinned and doesn't handle heat well? Me. Who's going to be in charge of keeping her safe if slash when the canoe tips over? Me. And I'm not even a good swimmer. By the way, I can barely even tread water. Great. We came to the conclusion as a team that canoeing wasn't in her best interest. The discussion effectively ended, yet he keeps passively bringing it up. Well, what do you think? Does that sound like a safe idea to you or not? Please let us know. I think her husband needs to get his head checked. Entitled woman calls state because we gave away kittens. So my mom has a small orange cat that she rescued. It's a very sweet moggy, has half a tail, and one day, about two months after being rescued, went out while in heat because my stepfather left the door open. Three days later, she showed up at home looking a bit rough and very hungry. We tried calling around to a few local vets to get her in and get her fixed, but none would take her. So we prepared for kittens and had five adorable babies. Once they were born, we immediately began lining up homes for when they were weaned and litter trained. This was easy enough. We had plenty of friends looking for a kitten. Now we had three spoken for and two in need of a home. Since none of our neighbors were interested, we posted a free kittens to good home ad on a site that rhymes with text for. Pretty quickly, one of the litter was selected and now we had to rehome the last. Nearly eight weeks have passed, 
The first four have all gone to new homes after turning seven weeks, nearly eight. Finally, someone comes forward and asks for the last kitten, and we happily send them their new baby. As we are homing her, we receive a message from our entitled person. We'll call her Karen for obvious reasons. She immediately launched into a tirade about how we are horrible people, backyard breeders churning out kittens and selling them to strangers. My mom politely advised that she mind her own business and informed her that we were taking no money for these cats. She sent a few more nasty emails about how we were illegally selling animals and she would report us to the state. Two months later, today in fact, my mom receives a call from none other than the state. They ask her about the cat and the kittens, to which my mom informs them that she can give them the name and number of each kitten's new owner and that she got the cat fixed the same day her last kitten went to its new home. A beat of silence, and they started asking about the dogs, all of whom have been fixed for years. My mom told them that the dogs had been fixed and were all in good health, then hung up. I'm a little gobsmacked that someone would go so far over rehomed kittens. I get being pro-animal welfare, but this is going a little far. Am I the jerk for kicking my sister out of my house? For context, my wife is in a wheelchair because she gets excruciating pain when she stands for longer than a few minutes, but is very insecure about it. Despite her wheelchair, she's never tried to use it to get pity from others. My sister, on the other hand, is rude to others and the typical social media bully. She doesn't have a job and always uses the excuse, nobody's hiring right now, when I ask about it. She doesn't like my wife, and I hear her on the phone sometimes calling my wife names she shouldn't be. Recently, my wife asked my sister for help with cleaning, and my sister replies with, I'm not doing anything here, and definitely not cleaning a bathroom. I was outside doing some yard work, so I couldn't do it for my wife. They argued, and my sister proceeds to shout, Fine, I'll just get OP. She comes out and tries to give some BS story about my wife trying to threaten her or something. I don't trust my sister, so I immediately go up to my wife and ask what happened. My wife explains calmly what just unfolded and I glare at my sister. I tell her that she better do it since she's been living here rent free for about 6 months now. My sister refuses to do it and starts shrieking excuses at us, which makes my wife angry too. My wife is the type of person that won't take excuses for an answer. She was a teacher. My sister sees this, then screams at us, Whatever! If that crippled woman can't do it! then I won't either. It's worth mentioning that I'm a chill person until someone tries to talk smack about my wife. I just snap and I tell her to get off my property before I call the police. She scoffs and says she'll call an Uber to go to her boyfriend's house. I ask, with what money? Her response, she pulls out a wallet that I instantly recognize as my 12 year old daughter's. My daughter was saving up to buy a game for her DS. I must have blacked out in rage because next thing I know, my wife is pushing me to our room and saying that my sister's gone. I asked what happened and she just giggles. As far as my sister is concerned, she no longer has the money she stole and is living with my parents. My parents called me threatening that they'll turn the entire family against me and they shouldn't have let me marry that disabled woman. They weren't allowed to come to my wedding because they tried to give my sister the venue. My parents' side of the family thinks I'm wrong for what I did. Am I wrong here? Edit. Thanks for all the support in the comments. A lot of you have commented asking why I didn't kick my sister out sooner, and I was going to until my wife realized what I was doing. She's such a kind soul that she wanted my sister to have a second chance. Edit too. Turns out that my sister really had nothing because she turned up again just to beg for a ride to a car rental place. I refused and said that she better get her boyfriend, who she tried to ruin my wedding with, to take her. He's a good 45 minutes away on a good day, so that's something. I didn't know how she was going to afford a rental with the little she had and she said that our parents were paying. I honestly didn't care and just let her leave. Karen refuses to pay for textbooks. My kid has just started high school and since it's the beginning of the school year in Australia, there's plenty of parents who are adjusting to how high school works. There's specific rules about pickup zones, no stopping zones, parking zones, etc mainly to keep the kids safe when crossing the busy road outside the school. Enter Entitled Mom, who for the last few days has decided the rules don't apply to her. Entitled Mom has a very large SUV and parks it squarely in the two-minute drop-off zone, over two spaces I might add, at approximately 2.45 p.m., waiting there until her kid comes out after 3 p.m. I tend to arrive early and park off to the side and read a book, so I've been observing her arguing with the duty teacher every afternoon with amusement. 
Yesterday, I saw Entitled Mom's kid, clearly not new to high school, in the senior uniform. So I'm guessing that Entitled Mom is just a pain in the butt about parking in general. Until today, that is. I went into the office at 2.30 p.m. to pay some school fees and sort out some admin stuff. I was less than impressed when I saw that Entitled Mom was already at the counter, so I just sat down and waited. A side note here, we pay something called the Resource Scheme annually, which means the kids get up-to-date textbooks and reference material. This is non-negotiable, and a student really can't participate in schoolwork without this in place. Entitled Mom was not shy about her displeasure about having to pay it. It seems that the scheme has gone up to $15 this year to allow for newer textbooks to be purchased. But Entitled Mom wasn't just upset about the extra $15. We've got Entitled Mother, we've got Office Lady, and we've got Deputy Principal. Entitled Mom. This is extortion. My daughter is taking the same subjects as last year. Why does she have to pay again? Office Lady. The resource scheme is payable as part of the school fees to ensure your daughter gets access to the best reference material. She doesn't need it. She got senior textbooks from the student who graduated last year, and she can just use those. I'm not paying it. Office Lady Those textbooks were supposed to be returned. The student who sold them to her will be billed for those textbooks, and some of them are not being used this year. We have upgraded to new science textbook. Extortion! There is nothing wrong with the old textbooks. You just want to make more money. Office Lady. Mrs. Entitled Mom, the new science textbook covers certain subjects in greater detail than the old one. Your daughter won't be able to complete classwork with an outdated textbook and will have the old ones confiscated. Entitled Mom. You'll steal them from her? To get more money? This is disgusting. Entitled Mom continues to rant about things that are only barely related to textbooks until the deputy principal overhears and comes out of his office at the other end of the building. Deputy Principal Mrs. Entitled Mom, what's the problem? This criminal is threatening to steal my daughter's textbooks. Principal looks at Office Lady, who just shrugs. Mrs. Entitled Mom, the school participates in the resource scheme where the students return textbooks at the end of the year and are issued curriculum-appropriate texts for the new year. This ensures that all our students have access to- Oh! So I'm paying for other students. Entitled Mom breaks off into another rant about how if parents can't afford books for their kids, they shouldn't be allowed into the school. It was at this point that the principal suggested they go and talk in his office. My transaction took about 10 minutes all up, and throughout it all I could hear Entitled Mom tearing into the principal. After completing my business, I wander back out to my car to wait for my kid. At about 2.55 p.m., Entitled Mom comes storming out of the office and discovers a parking flyer under her windshield. Not an actual ticket, just a flyer that advises safe parking zones, etc. The duty teacher has a stash to give to new parents who aren't sure where to park when picking up slash dropping off. I had the delightful opportunity to watch Entitled Mom lose her crap over a piece of paper until her daughter appeared and then drove off, exceeding the 40 km per hour speed limit. Alas. If only the local police had been on patrol, it would have been the cherry on top of a very entitled Sunday. I do work here. Now go wash the dishes. I managed three restaurants. I started as a dishwasher and worked my way up the totem pole. The owner recently retired and just pays the bills. The rest of the operation is on me. I joke around and say the chain of command is God, the owner, me, and then there is everyone else. A year or two ago, a new shift manager had been hired, and when you run three restaurants, it's impossible to immediately meet every employee. But anyway, I was in one of the restaurants sitting at my favorite booth, and I heard the new manager talking rather loudly. He was standing next to a server trying to take an order. Now this server has a slight learning disability, but is highly functional. Jerk was standing there in front of the customers saying things like, You have to be patient. She's slow. I'm helping her as much as I can. Oh, look at you. Your uniform is a mess. You need help. He was talking about her apron. You could get caught and hurt yourself. We don't want you to do that, would we? Berating her when she asked a customer to repeat their order. I leaned out of the booth I was sitting in and looked at Mary, the server. She saw me and I put a finger to my lips to signal her not to say anything. Mary gave a slight nod, indicating she saw me. I got out of my booth and walked around the kitchen. 
The cooks and dishwashers said, Hello, Mr. H. Decided to pay us a visit? Not right now. Tony knew by me just saying that something was wrong because we usually exchange banter between each other. Tony, do me a favor. Tell jerk manager there's a phone call in the office and tell Mary her order is up. I walked into the office, sat down, and waited. Jerk came into the office, and I saw Mary, told her I need to talk to her next and to sit in the break room. Jerk manager looked at me in my street clothes and, Look, payday isn't till Monday. No advances. I'm not here for my paycheck. Oh, you must be here for stock, he said. Me. No, I'm not here for stock either, I said. Then why the heck are you in here if you don't work here? He huffed. Oh, I work here all right. I am your manager. I only answer to the owner. The penny dropped. Oh, hi, Mr. H. It's a please to- Close the door. Now, I interrupted. I heard what you were saying and saw what you were doing to Mary. You call yourself a manager? How the heck did you get this job? He said. Well, Mary is a little- Me, a sweetheart who doesn't deserve to be treated like that. Yes, she has a slight problem, but she is one of my best employees and has more heart than you ever will. I am going to give you three options. One, I fire you. Two, you quit. Three, you take a demotion. It's your choice. Jerk said, How do I know you really work here? I picked up the phone and made a call to the owner. Yeah, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Look, could you tell Jerk who works for you? He doesn't seem to believe me. Yeah, I know. Have a great day. I handed the phone to Jerk and watched as the color drained from his face. He handed the phone back to me. Now, about those three options. Choose now or I will decide for you. I'll take the demotion, he said in a low voice. Good choice. Grab an apron and get on the dish tank. Dishes? You're making me a dishwasher? Yeah, I am. Do you honestly think I would put you in a position over others? If you work hard enough, I might make you a bus boy. He stormed out of the office and headed to the dish tank. The dishwashers who were back there were brutal. They considered him as a new hire. I started as a dishwasher, and when I started, I got the worst jobs. Jerk was back washing dishes and tried giving them orders. Okay, boss, we got it. And the snickering began. What? You believe me? We have more seniority. Now go get the garbage can and clean the filters in the dish tank. I heard Mike say, who's a dishwasher. I called Mary and said, Mary, are you okay, honey? And that's when the dam broke. Mary broke down sobbing. He does that to me all the time. He said if I ever told anyone, no one would believe me because I am a... No, no, you are not. Don't let anyone tell you that you are different. And don't ever let anyone make you feel like less of a human. You are just as needed as everyone else. We are all your friends here and we love you, okay? A slight smile came from her face as she looked at me, nodding her head yes. Alrighty, now go clean yourself up. Your mascara is running all over. Then go get your stuff and clock out. Am I being fired? Did I do something wrong, Mr. H? No, Mary. You just had a rough day. You will be paid for a full day's work, and I want you here tomorrow. And until your father comes to pick you up, sit back and listen. You might like what you hear. Now go wash your face, okay? Mary went to clean herself up and returned to the office. We sat and talked, then heard a loud crash of dishes. Watch this, Mary. I yelled from the office. That's coming out of your paycheck. And I heard more dishes crashing and heard Jerk screaming. Forget you. Forget these dishes. Forget these guys. Forget this restaurant. Forget everyone. I quit this job. I looked at Mary and said, I don't think he will be back. He seems a bit upset. Or is it just me? Mary's dad arrived. I told him the situation and I expect to see her tomorrow. She is a very good, hard worker. I don't want to lose her. And Mary, go home and relax and think about the jerk, all sweaty, dirty, wearing an apron, washing dishes and laugh. And remember, you are needed here. Now show up tomorrow or I will come and get you. And if a manager gives you a hard time, you call me. Mary left with a smile. And as I left, I walked past the dish tank and the dishwashers were sweeping up the broken dishes and laughing hysterically. I don't know what happened to Jerk and don't care. My father-in-law's girlfriend thinks she's an Instagram model. I give her a reality check. Father-in-law has been dating Kylie for about a year. She is an aspiring Instagram model. She doesn't work and he pays for her life. 
And if anyone asks, she says she's a model even though she isn't actually making much money off of Instagram. I don't think she knew who his ex-wife was when she met him, but my mother-in-law was a huge supermodel in the 90s. She was mega successful, traveled the world, and Kylie definitely knew who she was when she heard the name. Kylie hates her and constantly talks crap about her, to the point my oldest kid doesn't want to be around his grandfather because of what he hears her saying about his grandmother. Last time they were all together, she asked my mother-in-law how many guys she had to get with for the necklace she was wearing. Mother-in-law has a boyfriend and they have an open relationship, so Kylie was pushing one of her friends at him, who is blonde, and saying she found him a replacement because she knows he likes blondes, but her friend is younger. I'm so sick of having to witness this crap and having to worry about what is going to be said in front of my kids. Mother-in-law's boyfriend said, sorry, I don't date fake models, and they left. Kylie was saying what a jerk mother-in-law is, and I told her that he is with someone who was a legit model, so why would he downgrade? Kylie took this personally and said that he's rich and could be with someone younger. Again, I said, but he has a legit model. Just because father-in-law was an idiot and settled for an Insta model, why would he? Kylie burst into tears and father-in-law was very upset. But I'm so sick of her parading around like she's famous and successful. I thought my husband would be on my side, but he says I'm way too involved in his mom's drama. Now I feel a little bit like a jerk because I really think I hurt her. Do you think it was wrong for OP to say this? Or do you think our Instagram model got a taste of her own medicine? Please let us know. Talk smack, get cracked. That's what's up, bruh. Karen gets us suspended for a week. Okay, I work on elevators and was, at this time, an apprentice working on service jobs with a mechanic. We'll call him Rick. Now, Rick was a really nice guy. We got along really well, but he had a bit of a short fuse. Thrown tools were fairly normal if he got frustrated. Anyways, we were working on an elevator with the machinery in the basement, and some of it was only accessible from the elevator pit. We took all of the steps we normally would, put signs on the walls all over the buttons saying that the elevator was out of service, barricaded our work area at the bottom floor, shut the elevator down, and went to work. Now, this elevator had the buttons and doors on the same circuit as the cab lights, which is very unusual for elevators, and we hadn't turned the light switch off because, well, we wanted the lights. Entitled Mom never found out her name, now comes into play. I'm working in the elevator pit and I hear the elevator doors open and then hear the mom step in and the loud noise of the buttons in the cab being hammered. This quickly turned into her banging and then kicking the doors and screaming for help. This progression took less time than it would have taken for me to get a word in edgewise. I, being the nice guy I am, yelled up to her to press the door open button, but as the sign she'd have to move to press the button said the elevator was out of order. A few confused sounding seconds later, the door opened and the mom exits. I'm thinking, okay, no big deal, situation over. Nope. The mom storms down the stairs, pretty fast I'll admit, and starts pounding on the bottom door where we've barricaded off our area. So she's already inside a barrier that's very much there for her safety and she's screaming at me that I trapped her in the elevator and I need to turn it on now because her baby was on the fourth floor in her stroller and needed to come downstairs to go to an appointment. Now, Rick and I are, as I've said, pretty nice guys and if she'd come and asked politely when the elevator would be fixed, he'd probably have sent me to go help her. Hey, I'm the apprentice, that's the brakes, but I'd happily go and give her a hand. Today would be different. I stayed where I was because, frankly, she can't get to me so she can have her tantrum. Then Rick arrived. She saw him and his elevator company shirt and went off that I had trapped her and the elevator fell and her baby was in the hallway and needed to come down right now so we better get the elevator turned on right now. Now Rick is also very smart and has been doing service for many years. He calmly tells her we can't just turn it on, we have to complete the repairs for safety reasons. The mom goes off again, losing her mind at Rick before using the classic entitled mom phrase, I want to speak to your supervisor. Rick is prepared for this. You see, Rick is technically his own supervisor, and his business cards say service supervisor on them. So he hands her his own card and walks outside to the van. Of course, she calls him, tells a story that almost resembles what actually happened, which is the last straw for Rick. Don't lie to Rick. So he maintains his composure and tells her that our behavior was unacceptable and that he would be suspending us for a week without pay. After a few minutes, he came in, 
knocked on the door where I was waiting, so I opened it up. He leaned down and whispered, Pack up and act angry. So I played along, packed up the tools, and carried them to the van, straight past the mom still fuming in the hall. On the way out, she asked Rick what was going on and when the elevator would be back. Rick looked at her, deadpan, and said, Well, I just got suspended for a week, and I'm the only one who can do this job. So, in about a week. A week later, we returned and flipped the switch. I had finished while we were waiting for her tantrum to subside. Speaking of elevators, are any of you afraid of elevators? Please let us know. I love letting one rip when the elevator is full. Making my landlord pay over $100,000 for a sink. So I'm a college student and I rent a room from a landlord and live in a house with multiple other students. The contract for my room clearly says that I have to fix all the damages to my room that I have caused at my own cost and that all the bigger issues in the house will be covered by the landlord. Well, one day I noticed that my sink is kind of clogged and it's making a weird noise. He says it's probably my fault and that I should get a plunger to fix the problem. A little background info about the house that I live in. All the sinks at the top level of the house connect to the same pipe and everyone heard the same noise. So the chance of it being my fault would be almost zero. But since I had to fix the problem on my own, I tried my best. However, you might have guessed it, but I'm not really good at this since it's not my job. I even have my dad check it since he knows more about this stuff than I do and he says the pipe is clogged somewhere but doesn't know exactly how far down the pipe. So I tried my best to fix the problem myself, but since it's clearly a bigger issue that is not my fault, I contact my landlord once again. He still refuses to come and fix the clogged sink even after me clearly stating that everyone is hearing the noise in the house and tells me to solve my own problems like an adult would. Well, since I'm legally not an adult yet, and having tried my best, me and the other residents in the house had decided to give up trying to fix the issue and just let it be. A month later, one person in the house had water coming out of her sink because it was completely clogged and within days everyone was having the same issue. Because now everyone was complaining to the landlord, he had to fix the problem since it was a bigger problem within the house than everyone was experiencing. Not only did he have to fix the clogged pipes of all the sinks, but he also had to fix the water damage that we all had in our rooms because the water would just come out of the sink. When he finally decided to hire someone to fix the problem, the costs were already up to $100,000 and probably will be even more since some of the other people living within the house have sued the landlord for not agreeing to the contract and for neglect of his basic duties as a landlord. He even called us and screamed at us, why didn't we mention the problem earlier? To which I replied that I tried to solve the problem as an adult by informing my landlord who was supposed to fix it, but that this clearly didn't help. So a couple of additions for some of the comments. I just saw I made a mistake in the title and wanted to type for fixing a sink. I'm 17 years of age and in the country that I live in, everyone over the age of 18 is regarded as an adult and it's possible for people under the age of 18 to rent if they attend uni. Why the costs are this high is because it's an old house and everything had to be fixed. Walls and ceilings had to be removed in the entire house to even get to the pipes and all the pipes had to be renewed because they also were old and not in a proper condition. Due to the water leaking through the ceiling, some of the people's stuff in the rooms like TVs also were not working anymore and the landlord had to replace these. How I got to this estimate is because we talked to the guys who came to our house to fix this and they said it could easily be $100,000 because so much had to be torn down and replaced. Since it's a big house with many people living in it, you can imagine that it took a while to fix everything. Hope this helps. Have you ever had a plumbing problem that messed up things in your house? Please let us know. My toilet's always getting stopped up, but the Chipotle is worth it. <clears throat> yes. Am I the jerk for getting salty about my parents matching my sister's savings account with mine? Okay, this is weird. So this summer I got a job so I could help save up for college. Now I have a twin sister and I hate to say it, but she's one of the laziest people I know. I love her to death, but she doesn't do much for herself. For years I made her lunch because she always said she didn't know how to use the stove or oven. I'd offer to teach her, but she'd always say, eh, tomorrow. We're almost adults. I'd work six hours a day for four days a week. Every time I got a paycheck, we also got a meal allowance since it was connected to a school program and they wanted students to have a normal summer and lots of families are struggling at the moment. My mom would take the money 
and put it in my savings account, but she had also put the same amount in my sister's. In trade, my sister was to do a ton of chores and stuff. Normally, she'd do a little and go, okay, rest is yours, and I'd clean the majority. Personally, I don't care. If she wants to be lazy, fine, but I'm not gonna. So her now having to do the chores made her really upset. I made about $2,000, and that's all gone into my savings, and my mom had matched my sister's. The thing is, she hasn't done much around the house except wash dishes a few times and clean our room once with our mom while I was off at work. I only wanted to work for half the summer, so now I'm home for the rest of the summer until school opens back up. Now a few nights ago, I was talking about not wanting to use my second plate. If we have bread or salad, we have two plates to have room, so they wouldn't have to do as many dishes. I normally vacuum, dust, and sweep slash mop the house, as well as pick up my sister and mine's room and clean the windows, along with taking care of our cat. My mom does dishes and laundry, and my sister and dad do the occasional help. I also help my mom out if she asks. My mom says, oh, don't worry about it, because I'm not doing dishes tonight. So I thought, okay, so my sister and dad are. I finish, get up to go rinse my plate off, and walk back out to go say I was going to take a shower. My dad stops me and says I have to do the dishes. I explain the deal we made. The deal that was his and my mom's idea. My dad tells me that now that I'm no longer working, I need to help. Now I'm furious. I'm happy that my parents want to help out my sister, but I worked for half the summer, stayed up late nights stressing about getting things in on time and trying not to mess up, while my sister only has to do a few chores, which I do all the time anyways. I thought I was getting a break because of this. They're basically just handing money to my sister while I had to work for it. My dad is saying I'm being an entitled brat and should do what I'm told, like I normally would, but this seems so unfair. From my perspective, it looks like my sister is getting $2,000 for just doing what she normally does, just with my mom's help instead of mine and a little more force than me just taking over. So Reddit, am I the jerk? What do you think? Are OP's parents in the wrong or not? Please let us know. Her sister's going to make a fine Karen one day. Reminds me of my younger years. Not only do I not work here, but neither does anyone else. A bit of background. My house used to be the village post office, and when I say used to be, I mean over 20 years ago. We bought the property 10 years ago, by which time it had been totally converted and no longer resembles a post office in any shape or form. The post office is now slightly further down the street in a building that has a huge post office sign on the front and looks nothing like my house. Different size, color, everything. My front door opens straight into the kitchen and is rarely locked. It's a small village and I seem to run some sort of drop-in center for my kids' friends. I was sitting eating dinner this evening with my kids when the front door opened and in walked a lady. Me. Hey, can I help you with something? As I walked towards her, forcing her backwards through the open door. Lady. Yes, I have a parcel here to send. As she tries to duck around the side of me to get in. Me. Pardon? You've got a parcel? Lady. Yes, it's to be delivered tomorrow. Me. Well, you'd best be taking it to the post office then. As I almost physically push her out of the front door onto the street. Lady. Well, obviously, that's why I'm here. At which point, the light bulb in my head switches on. Me. I'm sorry, this isn't the post office anymore. Hasn't been for a long time. The post office is a few doors down that way. Lady. Yes, yes, very funny now. Could you actually do what you're being paid for and allow me to send my parcel? Me. Yes, if you go to the post office, which is just down there. Pointing. I'm sure they'll send your parcel for you. Now I'm going to return to my kids to finish eating dinner. As I walked inside, closed and locked the door while listening to her having a strop outside. By all accounts, she found the post office, sent her parcel, and lodged a formal complaint against me, which gave the post office staff some entertainment for the afternoon. I'm really unsure as to what she was thinking. She's not even from the village. As I say, it's a small village. And she walked into what is obviously a house with a family sitting at the table eating when she walked in. Did she think I had hidden the post office counter behind the fridge or something? My husband keeps wandering into the kitchen asking me for stamps or envelopes or various other post office type things. Am I the jerk for being upset at my parents for not helping me pay for college? My parents didn't have much money growing up. We always had the bills covered and a bit for the occasional pizza night and a gift for each birthday and a family gift for Christmas. My parents said that they wanted us all to go to college and even encouraged us to join free college prep programs at our school for first-generation college students. 
My brother has bipolar. He used to cry and scream in the mornings when he had to get ready for school every day, even when he was 18. He would sometimes skip class and smoke after school and didn't do well academically. After applying at all of the state schools, he got into the worst one, no scholarships. I worked hard in school. I was interested in medicine and I ended up getting some scholarships and got into great colleges. I talked to my parents about loans and FAFSA and they said I couldn't possibly afford to go to the good schools because the scholarship was non-renewable. I would have to pay all my dorm fees, tuition, books, food. I couldn't cover it. So I gave up my dream. I went to tech school and got an associate's part-time while working, worked and saved, then did four years college, all on my own. I was even asked to move out at 19 and still did it. The economy hit my parents hard. My older brother moved back home. After three years of college, he failed out and is now working at a gas station and periodically moves home when he can't afford rent. My dad found out. Mom took out loans in secret to pay for my brother's college. He's so angry, but I'm angry at all of them. Because if she offered him loans that she will need to pay back, why didn't they help me? He didn't even show up to his classes and was on probation. He failed appreciating the arts, for heaven's sake. Dad doesn't understand why I'm upset with him, but I really don't want to be speaking to any of them right now. I'm working a $35,000 teaching job and I'm drowning. Well, who do you agree with? OP or their parents? Please let us know. I used to have college loans too until I filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> yes. Do not make contact with anyone from work. Once upon a time, I was working with a major Australian telecommunications company. I worked in a call center with a group of underemployed lateral thinkers. It made work great as we were always discovering new things, but it made us a bit of a challenge to manage as the department tried to hobble us to fit into the cookie cutter molds they expected of call center operators. We had a manager who was, if I was to be generous, useless. He once went on leave for two weeks without a replacement being arranged. I put a balloon with a face drawn on it at his desk as our interim team leader. Team productivity under Mr. Balloon was measurably better than when the team leader was there, and I proved it with reports and all. Suffice to say, our manager did not command respect. Fast forward a few months, and one of our colleagues figured out how to spoof emails. Our manager had a certificate he proudly presented on his desk, saying he had graduated something something college, having completed a course in frontline management. He was extremely proud of this, and so the target vector was clear. My colleague went to an internet cafe, back when they were a thing, and sent a spoofed email to our manager. The email was built to look like it was from something something college. The email demanded that manager provide evidence of his competence as a frontline manager or his certificate would be withdrawn. Now, manager's world was appropriately shaken when he got this email. He must have complained to the appropriate higher ups because the infosec squad jumped straight onto it. They traced the email back to the cafe's IP address. Okay. In retrospect, we could all see this error in judgment. They printed out mugshots from the company's internal directory and identified my colleague as being the person who sent the email. Colleague was pulled into a day's worth of meetings as manager, manager's manager, etc. all lent on him pretty hard, trying to get him to confess so they could dismiss him for misconduct. I think the company realized they were on shaky ground to try and prove that colleague had really done anything wrong. Oh, the days before bullying was codified. Having sweated colleague all day with no effect, manager's manager put him on paid leave pending investigation with strict instructions, do not make any contact with anyone from work as they didn't want rumors of a pleb messing with the ruling class getting out. Months pass, colleague has not been in the office, the company has completed their investigation but need to let colleague present his defense. But his mobile is disconnected and he has connected a new phone number with a competitor. And he has moved home and he is not replying to emails. He has ghosted and the company doesn't know what to do. More months pass. I guess it gets to a point where the company can declare colleague legally dead or at least say he has abandoned employment. They stop paying his wages. A few months pass. Manager's manager is walking through a business district in the city and runs into colleague. Colleague is in a flash suit with a briefcase obviously hustling to a meeting himself. Manager's manager says, hello, asks colleague what he's been doing with himself. I work for the major tech company now. I've been working with them since a couple of weeks after I was put on paid leave. I would have told you, but I was told not to communicate with anyone from work. Thanks for that second paycheck though. Lady tries to get in my car while I'm trying to parallel park. 
A couple years ago, I was back in my hometown after being gone a few years interviewing for a new job. I love the city I'm from, and I had deliberately planned to be there for my birthday weekend so I could spend some time in some of my old haunts. I decided one day I would stop by the locally owned coffee shop where I used to spend hours consuming coffee and free Wi-Fi, catch up on old times. Now, the coffee shop is located along a very busy four-lane street. During off-peak hours, though, it's legal to parallel park in the lanes closest to the sidewalk. I've always hated parallel parking, but I decide it's easier than waiting for a spot to open up in the very small parking lot in the alley behind the coffee shop. I luck out, and there's an open spot at the very end of the road, so I just need to pull in. But it always makes me nervous pulling in because of how busy the road is, and when I get nervous, I get worse at parallel parking. So I pull up and start backing into the space and I think I'm doing okay when suddenly my back door flies open in the middle of me straightening up my car. A middle-aged lady just starts picking up a bunch of bags and trying to stack them in my back seat. The lady just starts trying to load her stuff in my back seat. Confused and still halfway in the road, I ask her, May I help you, ma'am? She replies, No, I just need to get all my stuff in and then I'll be ready to go. I still haven't caught on yet and I'm like, why do you need to load your stuff in my car? Where are you going? Well, I need to get the stuff in the car so you can take me to the location. I think I suddenly realize what's going on. Ma'am, I'm not an Uber driver, I say. I'm trying to park so I can get in the coffee shop. Now keep in mind that this time I was driving a 2011 Chevy Malibu that's seen better days. A couple dents, a smashed front end. This is on top of the fact that I'm pretty messy in cars and my entire back seat was filled with stuff from work to garbage. It wouldn't have passed the inspection if I wanted to be an Uber driver. I checked once when I was desperate for ways to make money. On top of that, there's no indication on my car that I'm an Uber driver, and I'm literally trying to parallel park my car. Surprised, she stood up, and her actual driver was on the side street just in front of us trying to flag her down. It was at that moment she finally realized what was going on. Oh well, never mind then. She said as she took all of her stuff back out of my car and marched over to her actual Uber driver as I finished parallel parking. No explosive entitlement like other stories, but I swear, someone is going to get in a car one of these days thinking it's an Uber and become story fodder for r slash let's not meet. And yes, I got the job, and it was a great birthday weekend. I was so happy to be going home, even if there's some weird people there. You think I'm trying to steal your money? Have it your way then. Some background. I'm a commercial and industrial HVAC R technician. We specialize in large AC and refrigeration systems, mostly involving chillers. It's first thing on a Monday morning when I get a customer's call in about one of their chillers being down. Cool beans, I don't have much on my schedule for today and haven't even left the house yet. This sounds like a great place to start off the week. I get there and find all kinds of problems with this chiller. We're talking at least a week's worth of repairs, assuming all the parts came in the next morning. For some context, this machine is absolutely ancient. By this point, I had lost count of how many times we'd tried to sell them a new one. Regardless, I make some phone calls so I can work up a price on the repairs and see how soon I can get the parts. A few minutes in and I find out that the manufacturer no longer supports this model. No big deal. I explain to the customer that we can either replace it or retrofit it. In my opinion, retrofitting a machine this old is a waste of time and money, but we have to give them the option. It pays just fine either way. After a 30 minute conversation with the customer and several lengthy phone calls, the customer decides it's finally time to replace the chiller. I tell him he'll get a quote in the next few days and talk to our sales team who sends it their way. Within minutes of receiving the proposal, the customer is blowing up my phone about how the price is too high and we're trying to steal their money. I'm driving so I can't talk, but have my phone mounted where I can see any calls and or texts I receive. After about 15 minutes, I pull onto the shoulder and give him a call back. He's still upset and starts yelling about how we added extra stuff to the quote just to take their money. Here's the thing, this new chiller uses a different style compressor than their old one. These new compressors are really, really loud. Normally this doesn't matter, but this chiller sits less than 100 feet from a large neighborhood and a daycare. The unnecessary extras he's complaining about are the sound dampening options for the chiller. Are they expensive? Sure. At the end of the day though, it doesn't really matter, they're going to need them. I tried multiple times to explain this, but he refused to listen and informed me that our conversation was over. Give me what I want, or I'll find a company that will. You know what? Sure thing, boss. 
I inform our sales office who had me hand deliver the new proposal along with a document explaining the issues with what he's asking for. I had him sign it and left him a copy. Three months and a few hundred thousand dollars later, and guess who can't run their brand new chiller? Why, you might ask? It violates the city noise ordinance. Anytime it starts up, they get fined. Need to fire it up to do maintenance? Fined. Need to fire it up because the other chillers are down? Fined. Control system hiccups and accidentally starts up? Fined. Their brand new chiller is nothing more than a big expensive paperweight. Even better though is that we're currently installing all the sound dampening equipment we originally quoted. However, as we're having to change everything out in the field, instead of it being installed at the factory, it's going to cost almost three times as much as it would have in the first place. But hey, maybe they'll listen next time. Threaten my roommate? Enjoy failing your class. During my second year in college, I lived with three friends in a house that had another four guys living on the other side of the house. The two sides of the house had a lot of mutual friends as my roommates had known them from high school. So we had tons of parties together during the year and got along pretty good, until a few months before final exams. Each side of the house had its own electric, water, and cable bills which we paid separately. I always handled our bills and paid them each month, but our water bill was actually in my roommate's name. I'll call him Bird. So one day, the biggest jerk on the other side of the house, Le Jerk, who handled their bills, walked into our house when I wasn't there and confronted Little Bird and yelled at him saying we owed him over $500. Apparently, their water bill each month was about $125 and ours was $40 to $50. Le Jerk thought there had to be a mistake in the billing, so we should split the bills down the middle. After I was told about this confrontation, I contacted the water company and asked about the billing. I was told over the phone the bills were specifically split up to each side of the house but a person would come out to check the water meters. The next day, a technician stopped by and looked at the meters to make sure they were operating correctly and that they were billing to the separate sides of the house. He confirmed there wasn't an issue with the meters or billing and basically said they are probably using more water. End of story. I told my roommates about this, but because of my schedule, I didn't see Le Jerk for about a week. During that time, he confronted Little Bird a couple more times who told him about the water company's position, but again he was yelled at, inside our own house, and was again told that we needed to split the bills with them. Then the weekend comes. My roommates and I head to a house party hosted by some mutual friends. At some point during the party, I was in the front yard when a friend runs up to me and says Le Jerk is trying to fight Little Bird. We run to the backyard and through about 50 people, I can see Le Jerk with his roommates behind him in the middle of the circle, pushing Bird, yelling that he owes him money, and he throws him into a beer pong table where he had held him down, saying he was going to beat Bird up. I nearly lose my mind as I see this, and immediately grab Le Jerk, say a few choice things, and shove him away. I wanted to do more, but it wasn't worth it. Yet. So Le Jerk and I actually had a class together. We weren't friends, never sat together, and since the whole water bill incident, we never even looked at each other in the 500 person lecture. He always sat with one of his roommates and I sat with one of my best friends, Rose. As the water bill fight somewhat subsided and the final exam got near, Le Jerk and his roommate started to act more civil and would even make small talk to Rose and I in the hall about the final worth 75% of the grade, topics to study, blah blah blah. They knew Rose and I had A's in the class. It wasn't a very difficult class, but I enjoyed it and actually studied quite a bit and knew I'd probably get an A and maybe I had let Rose cheat off me in the first test. I told Rose I had a feeling Le Jerk and his roommate were up to something since they were being so nice and that I expected them to try and cheat off us. So I came up with a plan if they tried. Now the format of the test is important. It was a packet of questions with the answers A, B, C, and D listed vertically and then you transfer your answers to a bubble scantron, which is another sheet of paper that gets put through a machine. Not sure how familiar people are with it. With this format, I told Rose that I would circle an answer, she would look over and circle the same answer, with a big circle ensuring that anyone looking could see. We would do this for the entire 100 question final before marking our answers on the scantron. The key to the revenge plan 
was that the actual answer was always going to be the answer directly below the circled answer. So if we circle A, the answer we put on the Scantron is B. If the circled answer is D, the answer we put is A. For a few days, I kind of thought I was being weird and crazy to come up with this plan because there was no way this guy actually thought he would cheat and I was blinded by anger. Either way, when the day of the final exam came, we got to the room early and I sat on the far right seat of a row with Rose to my left. Guess who strolls in and decides to sit next to us for the first time all year after he threatened my best friend a month before? Oh yeah, the jerk. Dude had no shame and snuggled right in the seat next to Rose with his roommate next to him. Rose and I could barely believe it and had to use some serious composure before the test started. The two of us operated like a well-oiled machine. We circled our answers, large, and at the end we went back through and marked the correct answers onto the Scantron. During the test, we could both see Le Jerk and his roommate leaning and copying our circled answers. Unreal. Fast forward to the summer break and Le Jerk's roommate came over to our side of the house when he saw Rose was there with me. He opened a beer and chatted for a bit before he finally got to what we were waiting for. So, how did you guys do on that test? I remember looking at Rose and saying something like, I don't remember exactly, but I know I ended up with an A in the class. And she chimes in saying, Yeah, that sounds about right, because I got a 92 on the test. The look on his face told us everything we needed to know, and he mumbled out, Really? Le Jerk and I both failed and have to take the class again. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.